turn on the mic. Is the mic on? Okay, perfect. Okay, I think we are ready to start. Um, before I start, just for logistics, uh, as some of you know, there is some echo. Uh, for those of you who are interested in French, you know, today's program will be a mixed uh, French and English. For those of you who are interested in the French translation, you need should to pick up a headphone from there. We have live translation here on site, and there is live translation on uh, via Zoom. Okay. Just don't know why I have echo here. Okay. Let me start on uh, behalf of the organizing committee of the LATSIS Synergia Symposium. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to the APFL and to our Rolex Learning Center and thank all the speakers, panelists, guests, and participants for taking the time out of their busy schedule to be with us and to share their experiences, insights, and exciting and impactful work. I'd also to like to thank the people and the organizations who made this possible. Let's see if I can get this. Can you go to the next slide? Perfect. Starting with my colleagues and members of the organizing committee who were instrumental in developing the program for the symposium and also providing all the scientific input and logistics to come up with the program. Equally important. All right, next slide. Is the person who really made all this meeting possible, uh, this um, Maria Rodriguez. I think most of you have interacted with her. She really the lead organizer in this event and, 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 and did everything that uh, allows us to be with us to, here today. Uh, Evelyn. Evelyn. Uh, Rushti is a PhD student at the Brain Mind Institute who also helped us with all the materials for the meeting, the brochures and, and everything else. And uh, great thanks to all members of the Lashua Lab for their support uh, over the past few days. Next slide, please. Okay, most importantly, I'd like to really thank the organizations that uh, helped us finance this meeting. Mostly the Latsis Foundation, which provided the seed funding, and the National Science Foundation through the funding of the Synergia Project in molecular and cellular modulation and Parkinson's disease, the Imaging Center at the EPFL for their generous support. And we're also grateful for the support we received from a number of companies, including Idorsia, AC Immune, ND Biosciences, Euphoria, some funding, including the Michael J. Fox Foundation and the Factor Foundation. Let me start by saying it has been more than a century since the key signatures or features of hallmarks of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease were first identified in the patients. And still then, we still do not have effective therapies to treat or slow the progression of these diseases, nor do we have diagnostics for early detection and monitoring disease progression. This is certainly not for the lack of trying. Thousands of sincere researchers, individuals, and organizations throughout the world are working hard and have dedicated their lives to understanding these diseases and finding cures. Progress in research is indeed slow, too slow for patients, as Benjamin always says, but we hope that patients and their families, including the ones with us today, realize that we are doing everything we can to understand these diseases so that we can find therapies. It's true that we have failed so far to find a drug or the treatment that could stop PD or AD, but we are learning from these failures and we are not giving up and slow progress is still progress. These failures have also helped us uncover the complexity of these diseases and open new opportunities to study and treat them. We have, we, we know the sense of urgency and we feel 
the mounting pressure. Nonetheless, the lack of therapies and continued failures of drugs in clinical trials should force us to pause, reflect, and rethink not only our approaches to understanding the causes of these disorders and how we develop therapies, but also to revisit and challenge our own assumptions, biases, and egos, and put our collective brain power to break the barriers that are slowing our progress towards finding groups. This is what this symposium is all about. The goal is to put the spotlight on the, on the conceptual and technical challenges that are slowing our progress toward new therapies and diagnostic. During the next two days, we will learn about the latest scientific advances, celebrate the progress that is being made by many of you here, but we will also challenge each other and engage in constructive debate and discussions to address not only many of the open and answered questions in the, that face us today and the public, but also many of the unquestioned answers in the field. I look forward to thought-provoking provoking discussions and debate that I hope will pave the way for new collaborations and ideas and how to leverage and integrate the latest conceptual and technical advances to address current knowledge gaps and technical gaps to advance translational research in neurodegenerative disease. Before we embark on this little journey, we thought that it is essential to start by learning about these diseases from the real experts. And the real experts are the patients, their families, and to remind ourselves about the human face of these devastating diseases and how they impact the lives of individuals and families. In the midst of increasing demands of our personal and professional lives and dedication to our research, it's very easy for us to become disconnected from the human reality of these diseases. We lose sight of why what we do and how we do it matters and how certain practices or lack of knowledge sharing and collaboration could not only slow progress, but prolong the suffering of individuals and families. The patients and their families are not only contributors of information and samples. They are, again, the real expert. And as we embark in developing personalized therapies, their role in research and drug discovery will only grow. In the near future, research and drug discovery will be driven by more data and input provided by patients than data coming from basic research labs like ours. And therefore, we need to engage patients as equal partners in all our effort to find cures for these devastating diseases. When we talk about patient engagement, we should be take, talking about partnerships with patients, caregivers and families as collaborators in the entire process. How do we do this is always not clear, especially to researchers like many of us whose work does not involve direct interaction with patients. I hope that through this event today, you will have a better understanding of how engaging the real experts could not only increase our motivation and appreciation of what we do, but also inspire us to do more exciting, collaborative and impactful research. Engaging the public and patients makes what we do more meaningful, more fulfilling, and makes our research more relevant, more reliable, and more likely to improve the lives of others. We're very fortunate to have with us today an impressive group of individuals and patients advocates who have, through sharing their lives and experiences, inspired many, led by example, challenged the conventional wisdom, and sparked many conversations and, and debates. So with this, we'll start the first part of today's event by watching three brief uh, documentaries on some patients and patients advocates, and then we'll, that will be followed by a panel discussion. Could you play the first video, please?
Today marks a new chapter in the history of humanity's forgotten families. Never before has a world leader recognized the suffering of Huntington's patients and their carers. The disease is described as the harshest affliction known to mankind. It is also the most misunderstood until today, the most hidden. Windows were shattered here in our NBC viewer. I'm happy to report that no NBC personnel were injured in this attack. Christine? My name is Charles Sabine, and I have Huntington's disease. In the course of 26 years as a television journalist living through more than a dozen wars, five revolutions, and four earthquakes, I witnessed many examples of people achieving the seemingly impossible. None, though, was inspirational as the tale I'm about to tell. The most profoundly difficult hardest aspects of the disease are common to all of us across the world whatever our physical conditions because it doesn't matter how much money you have with this disease you still suffer the same symptoms and horrible death uh, and you still pass the disease on to your children in the same way For generations, Huntington's has been undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. Doctors and scientists have struggled to find an effective treatment, let alone cure, for the devastating fatal genetic disorder. But in 1993, they were able to identify the defective gene when they found a concentration of families with the disease in a fishing village in Venezuela. We are in Barranquitas. It's a town at the shore of the Lake of Maracaibo. As a, a great prevalence, maybe the most um, around the world uh, of Huntington disease. Nobody cares about it. They have less than one meal in a day. 250 miles away in northern Colombia, 79-year-old Delia has already lost her husband and five children to Huntington's. She now gives 24-hour care to four more adult children, all of whom have the disease. Me toca bañarlo, cocinarle, darle la comida. Todo eso hay que hacérselos ahí porque ellos no pueden ya mover las manos ni siquiera para comer. Son mis hijos y yo me siento como si yo fuera la que tuviera la enfermedad. In a suburb of Argentina's capital, Buenos Aires, lives 15-year-old Brenda. She has juvenile Huntington's, which progresses much faster than the adult version. Most sufferers get little support from either state or society. Brenda is one of the lucky ones. She is cared for by medical geneticist, Dr. Claudia Perendones. On her last birthday, Brenda lost her father, Daniel, to the disease. She now lives with her aunt. <laughs> Pensamos, al ser chico no sabíamos que esta enfermedad iba a seguir. Uh -huh. Después siguió desgraciadamente con Daniel. Y bueno, lo cuidamos hasta el último día de su vida. Y... So many Huntington sufferers are treated as outsiders, almost like lepers by the communities in which they live. Yeah. Few organizations exist to help them in Latin America. The Factor H Foundation was set up by Nacho Munoz San Juan to try and alleviate the poverty and stigma experienced by so many. I see it as a, as a civil rights issue. Um, of course, in Latin America and in poor communities, the issues are much more magnified. In order for civil rights issues to be sorted out at a social level, 
the communities that are affected the most need to have their own voice and they need to be empowered. Another person who's devoted her life to Huntington's patients is one of Italy's best-known scientists, made senator for life for her work on the disease, Elena Catania. Together, we hatched a plan to approach the one person who could help sufferers in Latin America and around the world. And the request was uh, for a private uh, hearing, for a private meeting with one Venezuelan patient, one. From one, we are going to have this event with hundreds, hundreds of people that will meet together on May 18 from all over the world, 25 countries, because it was like an avalanche. We sent out the invitations so that they would arrive on Epiphany. This envelope contained a gift beyond their wildest dreams. di Huntington. Ecco il perché di questa vostra presenza, ecco il perché noi cerchiamo di fare in modo che appunto non siano più nascosti coloro che hanno questa malattia. The hope is that this will be a life changing event, but then you realize that it has already changed our life, certainly my life. It's just great fun, I mean, to see all of them so happy. It is uh, just wonderful that uh, they could be served. Central to the Hidden No More event is the presentation by a 15-year-old girl, Brenda, who has the disease, to Pope Francis of a pledge which states that any family who has Huntington's disease in their blood should not feel shame or stigma about the existence of that disease. the doors are open, um, people are now arriving. It's a huge occasion for the HD community and for people with rare and genetic diseases throughout the world. I'm going to show you now a short film to show you just a little bit about some of the families who are mostly along this front row here and their lives in South America. Santita, Caro Papa Francesco. Uh, Axel, the singer from Buenos Aires as well, she is going to present you a scroll describing the goals of this event for the Huntington's community. Tempo, le paure e le difficoltà che hanno caratterizzato la vita delle persone affette da Huntington. Esto 
mi familia, porque todos, todos estamos en, en una misma unión y en una misma batalla. Pero hicimos eso, hicimos la danza del Vaticano, ¿no? When you get the second video ready, I just wanted to say this is um, very emotional for me because I was at that event. It really changed many aspects of my life and how we knew and tackle Huntington diseases and other neurodegenerative diseases. I had the great pleasure of spending a week in Colombia with these families, uh, patients and their families. The next story is one of our local heroes and source of inspiration for all of us working in Parkinson's disease and, and uh, for a Huntington patient who not only embraced but has decided to fight Parkinson's disease with sport. So. <laughs> Je suis lancé ce défi parce que j'avais envie de, de marcher longtemps et puis de, de pouvoir réfléchir. Le concept de partir, c'est vraiment pendant plus de, de plusieurs mois. Ça, 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 ça apporte énormément. Je suis à, à 50 ans et puis je suis encore à croiser des, des, des chemins. Et puis euh, ben, j'ai des questions. Quoi. Et je vais retrouver les, les réponses pendant ces trois mois, prochains mois. Je ne fais pas ce voyage tout seul. J'ai mon compagnon de route qui me suit depuis 15 ans, M. Parkinson, qui m'accompagne. Trois mois. Quand j'ai pu diagnostiquer par de la maladie de Parkinson, j'avais 35 ans. La majorité, majorité des gens pensent que le Parkinson, c'est d'abord peu oh, on est vieux. Et puis que c'est que des tremblements. En réalité, c'est plein de choses. Et puis, le, le Parkinson, on peut l'avoir à 20 ans. Et puis, et puis euh, toutes, toutes les choses après qui en découlent, ben, c'est une maladie qui est très complexe. Au début, j'étais un peu dans le déni parce que je suis étant un grand, grand sportif à ce moment-là. Je ne pensais pas que c'était possible que je, 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 je tombe malade, surtout une maladie neurologique. Alors, il y a eu le déni, après il y a eu le, la colère, et puis toutes les phases qui s'en suivent. Le sport est de loin le meilleur médicament pour à la maladie. Parce que ben, le fait de bouger sécrète toujours cette dopamine, c'est la fameuse dopamine qui nous manque. Et puis, plus je suis en, en mouvement, mieux ça va. C est, c est, c est, pour moi, c'est le meilleur des médicaments. Un jour, j ai, j ai, j ai faisais, je voulais faire une vidéo pour, 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 pour faire un exercice de présentation. Et c'est là que j'ai vu le... Le choc, c est, c est, c est, je ne peux pas me mentir, le, le choc, quoi. Et puis, euh, j'ai tout d'un coup compris beaucoup de choses. Le fait que tous ces gens me regardent d'une manière bizarre et puis que les mamans prennent leur enfant de mettre de côté et tout ça. Et puis, ben, c'est dur. En période de dyskinésie, 
je, les gens me regardent toujours de manière bizarre. Il me fait mal, ce regard. Mon, mon but premier était de démontrer qu'on pouvait se faire quand même encore plein de choses, même si on était gravement touché par la maladie de Parkinson. Et euh, voilà, je pense que j'ai démontré avec ce défi qu'on peut réaliser ses rêves. Je suis un exemple de plus qui peut-être un jour motivera quelques personnes à, à faire du sport. Si, si, si quelqu'un à ça moi faire du sport, ben j'aurais gagné mon défi aussi. Thank you. And by the way, uh, Mr. Eve Overson is with us here today with his family, and he will be on the panel. Uh, we thank him for always being a source of inspiration for our group, and also for his, um, he always contributes to teaching our course in molecular neurodegeneration. So thanks, Eve, and thanks for being with us. Our third documentary or video is about uh, Gina Lupino. She's an intellectual property lawyer at Voyeur Law Corporation in Canada. And uh, she shares basically her story of, the, you know, one common thing about all the three videos is all the individuals who are diagnosed with early, uh, with these diseases, the early stage. So the video shares her experience of being diagnosed and her journey in trying to discover uh, more about Parkinson's disease and how to deal with it. Can you play the video, please? So what do you leave? When, 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 when? Like, when, when? When, when? When, when? Tuesday. You guys are going to fall apart without me? I oh got all choked up. I got off a cliff. I'm like having separation anxiety from leaving you guys. Gina doesn't use the fact that she has Parkinson's as an excuse to, um, to hold herself back. The fact that she can compose herself so professionally, I think that's just really. I just really, really going to miss her um, humor and the light that she brings. I know that she's making a trip out to Eastern United States, I, I believe New York perhaps, and she'll be driving from Vancouver on the West Coast all the way out there. Like sometime this spring or last this winter, I decided I'm gonna do this brain surgery called DBS, deep brain stimulation. And they just put probes in your brain to like, it helps, it helps with Parkinson's symptoms and stuff. And you decrease your meds and you, your brain's like electrically stimulated, the signals are electrically stimulated instead of like the chemicals regulating the signaling. It's, it's kind like, of like permanent in a sense, not like a, one month treatment. No, it's, it's like ongoing. Yeah, you become one of the machines. <laughs> Miss Gina, for your upcoming journey, um, safe travels. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you soon, hopefully. Hopefully when it's warm. I really wish you the best of luck in hoping you find what you're looking for. I'm sorry that I can't be there with you. Oh, thank you. Till we meet again. I don't think that this is the... Roll on down the highway. Imagine myself in an automobile A hundred miles an hour, only me at the wheel I want it to shine, to be only mine The engine has to be just a one of a kind How many dollars do I just meet, when I meet with like older people I just like hearing their thoughts on life Like what was important to them What would, if they can go back and t talk to themselves what, what advice would they give or what, would, what do they wish they knew? Hi! Hello, how are you? Hello! I'm Gina. Uh -huh. And you're 
Sharice. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Oh, all right. All right. Thank you. Well, when I was first diagnosed, I got angry. I'm not sure who I was angry with, but I got angry. And I can remember what the doctor said. I got good news and I got bad news. I don't even remember what the good news was. Yeah, I was going to say, what was the good news? Well, I waited two more years and four more neurologists, and finally I had to accept it. Yeah, I was working at NASA. Yeah, that's cool. I was a program project manager over a research support project. It sounds like it's a stressful job. So. It was stressful, and that didn't help the Parkinson's. Yeah. It has created a lot of challenges in our marriage, but we take it as a positive, and it truly has brought us closer together. The thing about Parkinson's is it's unpredictable. Yeah, that's the scariest part. It is progressive, but it's, it can be managed. What you can't do is let yourself get depressed. Yeah. Because I firmly believe your state of mind controls your entire being. Depression is your enemy. When you get depressed, the symptoms just take over. So you got to keep your mind right, positive. Like the saying goes, I have Parkinson's, but Parkinson's does not have me. <laughs> Nothing has you, it sounds like. It's like a squatter that you can't get out of your house. <laughs> Totally. I always say it's like an unwanted. He's not welcome. <laughs> but he's still there. Dr. Stern? Yeah. Nice to meet you. So good to meet you. Nice yeah, to meet you, yeah, too. Welcome to Philadelphia. So Thank you. So you've come from far and wide, huh? Yeah, I did drive four weeks to see you. <laughs> Hop in. So our travel companions here are Zach and Cookie. Hello, this is Zach. Zach. And uh, Cookie's right there hiding out. Awesome. Yeah, take a left up here. Let me know where to go. You know, if you were to sort of recap, this journey that you've had over the last three weeks, you know, what you started out thinking about and what, what you're thinking about now in terms of approaching your Parkinson's. It's interesting because in the, the beginning of this, I was pretty settled on having DBS. Uh -huh. So, I mean, still, still on the line, but thought I was going to do it. Not sure I was going to do it. This is something that's not going to go away, but if I just continue to work my ass off working out and just, accepting the fact that I can't work my, my day job as much as I used to. Well, tell me about that a little bit. What do you mean you can't work your day job as much as you used to? Well, if I'm working three hours, if, if, you know, if I'm stiff in the morning for an hour or two and I need to get eight hours of sleep at night, and if I am um, working out one to three hours a day and then I have to you know, eat and cook, practice of law is not forgiving. No, I know. And how much, um, how much would you say you're doing now? Anywhere from zero to like, five hours a day. Okay. I mean, I really cut back, like more than half. I went part-time officially. And is that okay? Are you comfortable with that or would you rather be full-time? I'd rather be somewhere between- Half and full. Half and full, like 60, 70%. That is a totally realistic goal. And if you're not there, then it's worth thinking about what you need to do next in order to get there. Yeah, that's a good perspective. I mean, it's true, it's, I mean- You pull over right there, right. There's a message in that story, I think. Yeah. And certainly for you, there is because it ain't your time. You got a long way to go. <laughs> That's what I want to hear. I'm not ready. You got to... a long way to go. I'm not ready for anything to stop. I feel like I'm just getting started. Exactly. So great to meet you. Nice to meet you. Look too. forward to seeing you again. Yeah, yeah. Great. Drive carefully, okay? Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. <laughs> I won't. Onward and upward. Be well. Love it. He's not your typical neurologist. He's more focused on talking about the individual and talking about me and what my goals are rather than just looking at me as a Parkinson's patient. He flat out asked me, what are your goals? Or how do you want to have balance between work and, and disease management? It was a different conversation than I've had with neurologists thus far. I didn't focus on medicine and symptoms. There's nothing you can say to reassure my parents that everything's okay. They have to see it themselves and, and experience it and see me on a bad day or a bad moment, see me on a good day and a good moment. And over time, understand that this disease is weird. It, it sucks one day and the other day it's, it's barely around. Today I'm having a more difficult day than normal. It'll pass, tomorrow will probably be better. When I go to yoga on Saturday, it'll be better. And I know I've seen that, my mom's gotten a little bit more comfortable with that when she sees me get up every morning 
drag my ass out of bed, whether I feel like it or whether I'm lazy, and what, what I'm doing and what the doctors are trying to do and what everybody around me that helps me, you know, my nutritionist, the physiotherapist, the, the martial arts instructors, the yoga instructors, I mean, everybody, the whole team, the whole village of people that, that are helping me. Once they see the, the big picture, they, they feel a little bit better, I think. I sense. I think, you know, when we watch these videos or meet patients and their families, one is definitely always leaves very inspired and motivated. But then one always asks the question of what can I do? And to help us understand what's the role of, you know, scientists and researchers in the community and how they can, what they can do beyond what they do in the lab to help patients and, and their families, I'd like to first invite my dear friend and colleague, Benjamin Setcher. He's the chair of the patient advisory group at Rune Labs in Canada. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's at the age of 29. And that sort of was a life-changing experience, made him leave everything, all his professional life, and starts a journey to discover what Parkinson's disease is over the past Five years have interviewed tens of scientists to try to understand the disease. And most recently, he even wrote a book, a book with Alberto Espe on called titled Brain Fables. And it's a book that actually challenges many of the prevailing hypotheses on the cause of these disease and has sparked many interesting and vigorous debate on Twitter and many other places. Without further ado, the stage is yours, Benjamin. Thanks for coming. All right, hello everybody and hello everybody that's listening online as well. So as Halal mentioned, um, I've been going around the world trying to see what the latest and greatest in this field is, trying to see what it is that patients can do to help advance the basic scientists, but also research in general. I've kind of found three things, but there's something else that I guess I need to mention right now is that, um, so you might've seen me walking a little bit funny on the way up here. Uh, before this, I took a little bit too much L-DOPA, so that's, the biggest reason why, um, and kicked in just at the wrong time for me, but whatever, I'll, I'll fight through it and get through this. So yeah, so as I mentioned, this talk is about the things that I think researchers can do to help uh, better, to help us today. And I think we, in turn then, will help you get better results if you do these three things. Now, they may not be the easiest things for you to do or the easiest things to listen to, but um, I think they are necessary steps for us all to take if we're ever going to advance these therapies. Love. Oh. Oh, sorry. So here's the first thing that I think needs to take place. Start studying people, not cells in the dish. Now, this is going to be very hard for a lot of labs and a lot of people all around the world to start doing. But there are new tools available today that will enable us to, I think, study real individuals living with these diseases, not just cells in a dish. I've been thinking for a long time also about a good analogy that can help me explain this a little bit better. And I think I found it with this. This is the Amazon rainforest. I wrote about this. Uh, on my blog, tomorrowedition.com. You can go and read everything about that I wrote there. But I was also helped in writing that by Brian Pepin, who's the CEO of a company called Rune Labs. He helped me to find the right analogy, and he helped me to find the right words to really describe what I was talking about here. And I think he's, he, so this is what he came up with as well. So he, he thought that um, the way we study this disease today is the equivalent of of uh, people trying to study the Amazon rainforest through a terrarium in their apartment. I mean, the complexity is all basically missing and gone in this terrarium here. There's no interactions with the outside world even. So I think that researchers need to really embrace this and take this to heart. This is what we need to start doing, to study real people living their lives out in the world. 
mice in a dish or mice in your laboratories, cells in a dish, they can't possibly recreate these diseases for you. One like easy, something else just to hammer that point home is that you know, you'll study protein aggregation or mitochondrial dysfunction or, your, or the genetics that we think are tied to this disease, but I can't feel any of those things in me. I only feel this tremor or the dyskinesia or the dystonia that I feel from time to time. Um, now today we don't have any clear links between those things that you're studying, those protein aggregates or those cells or those mitochondrial dysfunction or genes or whatever, and the, and the symptoms that patients like me experience every single day of our lives. That bridge right now that we need to cross, in my opinion, it's too large of a bridge for anybody to really grasp or anybody to really cross themselves. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's all sorts of correlations that we can make between these cells in a dish and the symptoms that we think we see in people, but they're all just correlations. There's, they're all, in my opinion, also they're very loose correlations. There's nothing that we can actually pinpoint and say, oh yes, this is what Parkinson's is. And it's what it is in a dish as well. And I'm studying this thing called Parkinson's disease. Next point though, is to remember something that me and Halal actually, we wrote about this quite a bit. The goal of research is not to do more research. What I mean is that at the end of every single paper that I've ever read in this field, it always ends with something along the lines of like, oh, we need to do more research in order to find whatever the next clue or the next step might be. And this is many ways a problem of our society today. Society is geared in such a way that scientists don't have the, the like, they, they don't have the ability to really study this disease holistically. You know, you have these strict four-year timelines that you usually have to follow. Sometimes it's two years, sometimes it's five years, sometimes it's even 10 years at the very best of occasions. But that's not, with, that's not in line with the natural course of this disease that you're studying. So again, just to hammer this point home a little bit more. There's a big misalignment problem that I think we all have to figure out how to properly solve. You know, we have researchers on one side and patients on the other side. And we're all, and we're, we're, we're building towards different goals, it seems like, all the time. All right, sorry. Next thing I'm gonna do is actually something that you shouldn't really do in a talk, but I'm gonna quote myself. Although this is me and Hilal, this is the start of, a, of what we wrote, it's called Rewriting the World. And here's the beginning of that. So this is from, uh, actually, I won't, remember, I won't mention who I was talking to at the time, but so he's, this was a young researcher who I went and visited his lab. And this is from that moment. That's it, that's the cure. I stood squinting at the graph in front of me. Whoa, the disease group really did fall back in line with the healthy controls. Maybe this target actually could swing the tides in our fight against Parkinson's diseases. I watched the eager young researcher as he flipped excitedly through the rest of his slides. Amazing, I said. Not entirely certain I understood everything, but wooed anyway by his enthusiasm and self-belief. So what's next? Well, the journal wants me to run a couple more experiments in animal models and connect this to the field's belief in protein aggregation. Once it's published, I'll be able to form a company through my university to develop bioassays to identify a lead compound. It shouldn't take more than five years to get out of preclinical development. At that point, I knew I was screwed. And then, this, oh, yeah, it's kind of self-explanatory as well as for, this is for all of society, really. I think we all need to think about better ways to actually uh, motivate individuals and people towards goals like Parkinson's disease. At the moment, it's driven by a need that, uh, there's a need that, uh, share, that we, all investments have a return on investments, but that is holding us back in a lot of different ways. Finally, this is the last point that I'm gonna have for today. We have new endpoints now that we all, that should be used in all clinical trials going forward. Today, or yeah. So today, every clinical trial asks patients to come to their clinician or come to their clinical trial center and go through the UPDRS test, Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. That test is a very arbitrary snapshot in time of, um, of what this patient is experiencing. But it's only one moment in time. We can now, through devices like this Apple Watch 
and Medtronic implant that I have deep in my brain, monitor patients all throughout the day and get something that is much more like a video of their entire day or week or whatever, or month or however long we need right now. I'm gonna show you what that looks like for me. This is my own data through a company called Rune Labs and through an app called Strive PD. So at 10.30 on this day, this is actually taken from three weeks ago. However, I can go back and look at any time, any day that I want, any time that I was wearing the watch at least. What it shows is that at 10.30, which correlates exactly with when uh, me, and, I was in my clinical office and we made a slight adjustment to my DBS, my deep brain stimulator. And as soon as we did, I felt a, a marked decrease in my tremor. It didn't go away completely, but I did feel like kind of nudged down a little bit. That's exactly what this graph shows as well. That right at 10.30, there was something that happened and then my tremor just, it was less severe afterwards. However, my heart rate also went up. I don't know what the, I do not know what that is. But that is why I think people like us at Rune Labs and Strive PD, why we need researchers around the world to help us better understand this data. Because we have so much data now that we don't know what to do with, frankly. And there's so many things that are being built on top of this as well. And in the future, I mean, soon, the Apple Watch is gonna be a glucose monitor. It's gonna be a, it's already an O2 monitor. And within two years, it'll also be a blood pressure monitor as well. And there's so many other things as well that this thing can do that are just amazing to me. I never thought that this would be possible in my lifetime, but here it is and here's what we're able to do now. Now this last uh, point that I wanna make, it's very simple, but by a guy named Jacob Br Branovsky, I think is his name. He's an author, he's a very celebrated author. He's probably one of the world's greatest, he was one of the world's greatest authors and philosophers. And here was his message for all of the PIs out there. Now, the message is very clear to me anyways, but basically it's this, that um, your students in your lab, they're the ones doing all the work for you, but they need to be able to challenge everything that they're seeing in their labs. What I would recommend is that you have students in your lab that challenge you every day and that think very differently from you as well. If they all think and just align with what you're doing, then you're doing something wrong. I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna play with that anymore and just let him speak now. And with that, thank you for listening and back over to the lot. Thanks, Ben. Brilliant as usual. So our, now I'd like to invite to the podium uh, a, free, a close friend, amazing scientist and a role model. Ignacio Sanduan is the vice president of translational biology at CHDI, neuroscientist with 18 years of drug discovery experience in neurodegenerative disease and neurophysiology. But most importantly, he's an empathetic an empathetic, empathic scientist and humanitarian and a great role model to me again. Thanks for being with us and he will share with us, you know, sort of an inspiring story on what scientists and very, very, very busy scientists can still do to help patients and their families. Thank you very much for being with us. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, can I have my presentation up? Okay, meanwhile, the presentation, the slides go up. I just um, wanted to say a couple of things. One is that I'm a neuroscientist. That's my, my paid job. I've been working in the field of Huntington's disease for 15 years, <clears throat> trying to develop therapeutics, mostly targeting the generic cause of the disease. Um, but I'm giving two seminars, two seminars today. The first one, the first one is, has nothing to do with science. I don't know, somebody's, are, are you trying to tell me something? Okay, there it is. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. So you saw the documentary um, of some Huntington families with the Pope, but you probably um, didn't know is that that was an attempt by me and several other people to try to get some attention to 
the families, particularly of Venezuela, um, where there are towns with the highest prevalence of funding transitions in the world. So the talk today is going to be about some of the humanitarian work I've, I started about 10 years ago to try to help uh, those families. Um, so I'm going to start with a few photographs so that puts things in, in, into some context. Okay. It's, it's the green one. I know I'm pressing the green one, but it's not working. Okay, there it is. Okay, Huntington's disease is a bit different from other, from other diseases and the major difference is that it's exclusively genetic. So whenever you see a person with Huntington's and they have relatives or children, they're all at risk with a 50% chance of developing the disease. So the work that we're trying to do with these communities in, in South America and particularly Venezuela is putting also um, some uh, a level of foresight on the new generations that are coming up, but hopefully those will be the generations that will benefit from the therapeutic progresses that, that we're trying to make as scientists, but clearly the disease doesn't stop with the individuals that you see with symptoms today. So the, the history of Huntington's disease was radically transformed after 20 years of research in communities in Venezuela, flanking the west coast of Lake Maracaibo, international team of neurologists and scientists led by Nancy Wexler. In, uh, just to give you an idea, um, over those 23 years of research where people would come every year, um, more than 18,000 individuals contributed samples, both DNA, skin samples, in many cases, brain samples, for us to be able to identify a scientist, the gene. And from my perspective, this was a landmark paper in the history of neuroscience. What I didn't know at the time were the conditions in which people who participated in these studies were, were living. Okay, just to give you an idea in terms of the, um, they contributed to mapping the gene in 83, uh, discovered the gene in 1993. Uh, for the first time, they identified homozygous individuals uh, with two copies of the defective gene in the Huntington gene, um, and was a strong supporter of the gain of function hypothesis, which has also been uh, used in many other indications. Uh, understanding the symptoms beyond motor to cognitive and, and developing potentially early functional scales in the cognitive and psychiatric domains. Um, the first evidence that there were genetic modifiers and 30 years later, we've now identified what those modifiers are. And finally, they donated many, many hundreds and thousands of research samples that everybody, including myself, have, have used over the years. So, in, uh, you know, in, in the case of Huntington's, where everybody has the same mutation, that really enables people, mostly in developed countries or in North America and Western Europe, to uh, get a genetic test that tells you whether you're going to develop the disease or not. It also tells you, um, and, and uh, mostly um, enabling reproductive choices for women, um, which are available in many countries, but are completely unavailable in most developing nations, including in South America. And finally, the enables drug, drug discovery. All of the work that we do is dependent on the fact that we know the cause for Huntington's disease in the Huntington gene. So the symptoms of the disease, I think it's important to understand that is a, a whole range of symptoms with different prevalence throughout the course of the disease and also in different individuals. So even individuals within the same family can manifest very different symptoms throughout the course of the disease. And um, uh, that means that we need to understand and manage different types of symptoms um, um, and um, the complexity of the circuits that are underlying the alterations that get manifested in those symptoms is very complex. And I think we tend to minimize it in the drug discovery process. In addition, as I said, it's a genetic disorder. A genetic disorder means that for every person that's affected, Every child has a 50% chance of being uh, affected with the disease and the relatives also are affected. So the normal family structure is completely destroyed in Huntington's family. So you would normally rely on your mother, your father, your sister, your son, your daughter to help for you if you have the disease. But they may be affected as well, many times simultaneously. What this means is that the non-scientific, not medical aspects of managing the symptomatology of the disease becomes really critical. And I've listed a few of these. There's also ample discrimination. There's in, many, in many places, there's no social support. People can be fired because they have the disease. So there's lots of things that need to be included 
uh, as part of the disease management strategy, particularly in, in countries such as Venezuela, where the health and social infrastructure is completely torn by socioeconomic and political uh, context. So what is the situation for the families in Venezuela today? Obviously, the people who contributed to the samples that led to the cloning of the gene already died from Huntington's disease, but their descendants still live, many of them, uh, their parents contributed samples. So I'm just gonna show you three pictures. This is the town of Barranquitas in Venezuela. This is the way I would say 90% of the Huntington's patients live. Uh, no running water, no septic sewage system. This is the type of houses that they live. It's about a, a 40 degree temperature with 100% humidity, no medical um, uh, facilities. So when I first visited in 2012, um, this is the type of situation where I found people to be uh, with Huntington disease living in. No furniture in, 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 in their shacks, no running water. I was really astounded that this is the conditions in which most of these people whose parents contributed to our advance in understanding the disease were living. In many cases, we would see young children at risk for Huntington's disease taking care of their parents. So because of this, we decided that we needed to do something, or at least I felt I needed to do something. And 10 years ago, it was an individual project that now became a uh, nonprofit foundation. And I'm gonna end with two videos and a couple more pictures that kind of capture a little bit why we're focusing so much on basic assistance, but also on the future generations uh, for which there are many, many children living in very difficult situations. This should be sound. Okay, let's see. Okay, so, you know, sometimes some of these things are difficult to see, but I think it's very important to not forget the faces of the people who were trying to help ultimately through research. And I believe research is the way that we can completely eliminate the suffering, or at least significantly broadly throughout the world. But there is a very significant inequity in access to all kinds of medical and social services between Europe, North America, and many other places. And uh, part, of, part of the reason for me to start this humanitarian foundation was to, to tackle and bring science and medicine to individuals to inform them, but also be able to, to influence other aspects of their lives. So the, the, the vision for us is essentially a world, and not just to Europe and North America, with any family or communities affected with Huntington's disease live in dignity, equality, and prosperity. And they have uh, their basic and fundamental rights respected, including the right to health and education. So because of this, we have four pillars, and I don't have time to go into all of these, but you can go to the website and check it out, or you can talk to me. Uh, health and disease management, youth programs, community development programs, and data collection and advocacy by which we generate census of patient uh, databases that enable us to influence local government 
uh, and receive assistance uh, in terms of local uh, programs. Uh, we work in three countries, in Venezuela, where we're supporting about 300 families with Huntington's disease and 350 at-risk kids that we sponsor. Um, in Colombia, very close to the Venezuelan communities, is the largest uh, region in South America. Outside of Venezuela, 135 families and 114 at-risk kids. And then in Peru, these are the three largest communities of HD uh, in the world. Okay. Uh, let me just end with a short video uh, of uh, these are some of the pictures in Venezuela feeding the children. And let me just show you one video of a very special kid that I met a few years ago, who is part of the program. And with that, I will conclude. Meet my 13 year old boy I met in Venezuela. In every corner, one finds another person afflicted with Huntington's disease wandering the streets. A town where stories repeat themselves generation after generation. Another human. Human being afflicted with Huntington's and dying in obscurity. The Lake Maracaibo, flanking the right side of the town, glows in the unrelenting sun, dark and bright at once. The only school in the town lays dormant, all furniture stolen, the voices of the children long gone with hot wind coming from the lake. From the corner of my eyes, I saw a little kid following us. He stayed at a safe distance. He looked at us wondering why we were there. I called him over, but he hesitated. Even though he was only 11 years old at the time, he had lost his mother to Huntington's a few years back. His father, I asked. He said he was shot and killed two years ago. We asked where he lived. He didn't want to say. We insisted. We said we wanted to help. He lived alone, alone at 11. A decaying filthy mattress lay on the floor of a tin hut. Inside, there was no furniture, no bathroom, no kitchen, no clothes, no books, no pictures, nothing. It is as if his very existence didn't matter. He didn't exist to the world. How many other kids like Brian are there in this town? In a scientific world where we want to measure and quantify everything, how do we measure the impact that hope has in a child or in a community? I wonder, is changing the sense of hope for one single child enough? So I said to our colleagues, treat them like they're my kids, give them a bed, clothes, shoes, find them a teacher, find them a home, give them hope. They are important, not forgotten, not lost. Okay, I think I'm gonna conclude here. Um, Thank you for listening. I'm available to ask any questions. And there are many different ways that anybody can help, as simple as sponsoring a child, as simple as reaching out to the local chapter of an HD or Parkinson's Association and say, I'm going to sit down with you. I'm going to hold your hand. I'm going to say hello. And you're going to listen. And that's how I started. And you just never know where things are going to take you. So thank you. May I ask Benjamin if to sit on the chairs on the front? Hello, Gina. Get the sound. Yes. Hi. How are you? Hello. Good. Good to hear you. Sorry you couldn't be with us, but we're looking forward to see you here in a few weeks. Um, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to be with us. And uh, while everyone is sitting, I was wondering if you have a few words to say or uh, some reflections on what you've seen so far. Yes, I do. Just a couple. I'll be brief. Um, thank you for inviting me. Hello. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, patients like me and Ben really value participating in these kind of conferences. 
And we really think it's very important for patients and um, researchers or, or clinicians to, to collaborate and um, together finding solutions, not existing in separate tunnels or separate silos and then coming together only once a year for uh, a clinical trial or for an appointment. But two things that I noticed already from um, both Ignacio and Ben's presentations was both of them are aimed at, at emphasizing the importance of um, how, understanding how the research results affects the patients. And we saw really, really um, vivid pictures of what uh, people basically not receiving treatment in Venezuela. Um, and it's important to remember that it's, Venezuela is an extreme case and they need prayers and help as much as possible right now. But um, there's, there are a lot of people in places like US Canada who don't have access to enough. I mean, they might have once a year see their neurologist, but it's really critical that um, they have more access to, to resources, whether they're doctors, neurologists, or other healthcare providers. And, um, and of course, getting their opinion getting factored in during the research project or research process. We're going to use taxpayer money to invest in in research. It's we only owe it to the taxpayers to to consider their voice um, and the results. Which which way we go about spending money to get good results. And the other thing I noticed, and especially in Ignacio's presentation, was the importance of community. And it reminds me of what I always say: is the, the motivation why I did the film and the reason why I do advocacy work um, is because. When I was first diagnosed or symptomatic, the, the thing that helped me the most was reaching out into the community. I learned through Ben was one of the first people I met and he was a mentor. He still is a mentor and helps guide me, has helped guide me over the years um, in many different ways, just dealing with the, the newness of the disease, understanding the science behind it. Um, it's, it's really important. It'll save a lot of people a lot of time and the more that they know that there are other people out there that, um, that are living with this, this disease like they are. Right. So it's, it's nice to see that, just that role at a, at a, at a research focused conference. It's not every day that we get to, to provide patient perspectives or, or provide a perspective of um, somebody working with patients in places like Venezuela. Thank you very Thank you much. Very much. Uh, let me start with one, uh, maybe before I start, I would like to invite everyone who's connected with us via Zoom or people who are here would like to raise questions to our panelists and speakers, just prepare, you will have a chance to do this. But, you know, in, in, in listening to some of your interviews, I was struck by the fact that you, you know, that just for somebody who's just, you know, struggling with the diagnosis or the fact that I believe you had mentioned that it took a year and a half for you to get an accurate diagnosis. I mean, this is just sort of, you know, really astonishing in, to, in today, given where the science. Could you, could you talk about this and also talk about some of the experiences and frustrations or feeling during that period, when knowing that you have something, but you don't know what it is and what did, how did it feel afterwards? Yeah, it's, it was a... a a year that was just unreal. There's nothing like it. Um, they, well, I was at first symptomatic in January 2014, and um, I noticed my right wrist wasn't articulating the way that my left, left wrist was, not I was in a percussion band, I was playing a snare drum. And I thought it was just because I had had pneumonia a couple of weeks ago. I was in bed for three weeks. I was out of practice. And, but I figured out oh, maybe it's a pinched nerve or something. I didn't even know what Parkinson's was. I didn't, I had never met somebody with Parkinson's. I had heard of it, but that's about it. And I figured, why not just go to the doctor? So I went to the doctor, got referred to specialists, um, and then I got referred to another specialist. And that whole process in British Columbia, Canada, took um, a long time. It took about a year, a little less than a year to finally sit and meet with the specialist. But even once I started meeting with the movement disorder specialist, it still from there took a lot, another year and a half um, to, go, to go from the initial meeting or initial symptoms to the diagnosis. So, it's, Parkinson's is a really hard thing to diagnose. I am young. Um, the symptoms do look like symptoms for, of other diseases too. It's just, it's hard for, it's really hard for, for clinicians to help to diagnose these things. Um, so they thought I had MS for a year and a half. And I thought, I figured, okay, I'm going to wait, wait for the test results and, and wait for the medication. But in the meantime, I'll start exercising. That supposedly helps people with MS. Year, and a, year goes by. Um, 
no MS. They thought I had um, maybe a stroke. So I got tested for that, no stroke. And then I came back to Parkinson's. It was kind of like the last spot. So that year, I remember it was like a roller coaster. It was, it was frustrating. Um, I knew it was like a marathon. I knew if I just waited and waited and waited and, and was patient, I would eventually get some information and slowly, slowly, slowly got there. But um, it's during that, even during that year um, and, and right after I was diagnosed, it was, I, turn, I always turned back to the communities. It was the MS community at the time, um, whether it was researchers publishing publications, research publications, or um, just people blogging. And um, it was during the time right after I was diagnosed that I met Ben because a friend of mine was looking online for like futurism blogs or something. And Ben had written something and he said, hey, there's this guy in Toronto. I was in Vancouver at the time. He said, there's this guy in Toronto that um, blogs. He's young and he's got diagnosed with Parkinson's. You should get in touch with him. And we got in touch and we've been friends since. So it was, the year was very frustrating, the year and a half. And I don't know if that's a function of my symptoms not being really vividly par Parkinson's or if it was a function of the British Columbia healthcare system having to wait for several months before MRIs and appointments, but it, it was a very a frustrating year. Um, it tested my patients like nothing else in my life. And each time I went to the doctor and they changed, you know, I thought I had MS in the beginning, then they said, no, it's stroke. Each time I went, there was a new shock and grieving process. <laughs> so at, by the end of that year and a half, I was so exhausted. By the time that I finally received a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, and um, I was devastated, but at the same time, I was incredibly relieved because I had direction now. I wasn't wandering in, in the darkness. So, so maybe I sort of have a question to, uh, to the three of you. So we'll start with Benjamin, uh, Eve, and, and then Eugene again, feel free to, to chip in. And so when, you know, most of us here are scientists, you know, working on, at least they have Parkinson and Alzheimer's disease, we're so much trying to figure out sort of what's the problem of what happens in the brain. And specifically this group and the theme of this conference is really trying to understand why these proteins clump in the brain and how do they affect the neurons and how neurons die. But it turns out that there is much more to Parkinson's disease than some of the you know, visible symptoms that are manifested by this loss of neurons. And I was wondering if you could share, maybe you know, Benjamin, sort of what are some of the things that you experience in Parkinson's disease that you feel people don't understand and don't see? And, and that, you know, what are the things that when you go to see the doctors, one of the things that I've frequently heard uh, here from patients is that doctors don't have enough time to go beyond the visible symptoms. And so I'm curious to, to if you could shed light into, you know, what is Parkinson's disease to you, you know, and uh, with respect to, you know, the, your interface with the clinicians and, you know, what do they focus on and what is still ignored? Hello. Okay, there we go. Um, so I'm one of the lucky ones in that regard in that for the most part, what you see is what you get with me. Like most of my sym symptoms are visible symptoms, the tremor, the dyskinesia, bradykinesia. Uh, there is one that's somewhat uh, usually not seen though. And it's one actually that ties into your question as well. Because I wish my doctors would actually take my shoes off during, my, um, <laughs> during the visits and look at my feet more because I often have dystonia in my feet. It's like a cramping. It kind of looks like that. Um, I, won't do it. I won't take off my shoe now, but I do wish that um, more clinicians and researchers and people in this field look at patients' feet more often. Might not be the nicest thing to do, but I think it's a very, tell it's probably the, big, the most telling sign that I have of how I'm feeling at any time of the day. But I know that Gina, actually, she could talk a lot more about some of the other symptoms that go on in this disease that patients often experience. So if yeah. I was, so, and Laura, maybe you can. Yeah. Again, 
Yeah, it's a Eve. Bye bye. And Laura, it's late. So, uh, for the audience, um, this is Ivo Berson. You have seen uh, his uh, movie. And actually, at the moment, he has very difficulties to speak. And so, we have decided that uh, he uh, get all the questions from Hilal in advance. He has discussed that with his best friend, who is here, Christine, and Maya, his mom. And basically, uh, they will take over the discussion for him. but. Everything that they will say has been fully approved by Eve in advance. <laughs> okay. Um, donc, on peut répondre à. Peut-être tu me reposes la question. <laughs> Peut-être en français que vous puissiez y revenir, mais j'ai perdu le fil. La maladie, le diagnostic. Alors ça, c'est quelque chose qu'on n'a pas encore vraiment parlé. <rire> euh, mais je... Euh... Ouais, c'est plutôt en fait pour pour Yves, en tout cas ce qu'on pourrait dire c'est que à partir du moment où le diagnostic a été posé il y a eu comme un espèce de néon tu m'arrêtes si je dis des bêtises par rapport à la médication surtout je pense que Yves la famille et les familles la famille proche s'est senti un peu que faire par où commencer en fait comment, comment se passe cette médication, cette fameuse médication qui fait vraiment peur euh, Yves s'était vraiment beaucoup, beaucoup renseigné sur les effets secondaires de la, maladie, de, de la médication et je pense que c'était vraiment une de ses craintes euh, la plus, plus flagrante c'était ce, cette espèce de cycle de médication qui fait qu'on peut prendre un certain cycle de médication tout un temps, il va y avoir un palier et ça ne s'arrêtera pas, il faudra arrêter à ce palier et ensuite un deuxième cycle et, ça, et on ne peut pas revenir en arrière. Et en fait, dans, dans ce premier, quand le diagnostic est tombé, c'était comment ne pas, euh, comment freiner ce cycle de médication, le retarder le plus tard possible pour pouvoir avoir in fine euh, une plus grande espérance de vie. Et je pense que c'est vraiment euh, ce qui a été le plus... plus euh, flagrant et le plus difficile avec Yves et son entourage. C'était comment gérer cette médication. Et peut-être là, au niveau de la médecine et peut-être de la recherche, c'est comment expliquer en fait, ce, ces cycles de médication, comment accompagner de manière vraiment beaucoup plus régulière. Parce qu'une fois que le diagnostic tombe, il y a un espèce de flou, un espèce de néant où il me semble que Yves n'était pas vraiment accompagné. Seems that I have to translate uh, the French to English. English. No, you do the translation. So it's okay. No, I can no. ask in between. You do the translation. I do the translation. <laughs> As the translator, I say no. Okay, sorry. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> but, but the problem is, uh, I'm not. Yes. The problem people, not everybody has the, the headphone. So, ah, to so okay. So basically, I will make uh, the transition a bit shorter. But uh, what actually they were saying that is one that you have been diagnosed by the neurologist. There is like a gap between what uh, you understand when you were with a neurologist and what you have to do the next step. And actually the family is not aware about the, the disease, the friends neither, so it's very difficult for everybody to really catch what is the next step. And so as the patient, you are completely lost, as the family, as the friends, and nobody can really help. And then you start to take the pills and the medicamentation, and it's where you get even 
more lost because there is this cycle of hours of medical notation. Then you have to put an alarm on, uh, start to take it very regularly, but your body feels like you don't need. So you try to have the tendency to push forward, I think, the medical notation. And nobody is here to help because finally you see the neurologist maybe 15 minutes during the year. And in between, you are completely lost. Okay. Okay, thank you. Tina? Yes? I was wondering if you have uh, uh, anything to add in terms of, uh, you know, dealing with sort of the, I guess, the other symptoms of Parkinson's disease that are not visible. You know? um, yeah, I mean, I always recommend people, and I focus on doing this myself, um, bringing a list of or lists or videos or bringing some data to the, the appointments because the, the non-motor symptoms are not as evident. We don't walk in the office and, and they don't appear. And then some days when we have our visits, we don't experience those non-motor symptoms, but the minute we walk out of the office or wake up the next day, we do. Um, so I think it's important to, if the doctor doesn't focus on it um, or the, the, clinici the clinician doesn't focus on it, just keep a list and be prepared when you go to the meetings once a year or once, if you get there at all, um, bring in your data and then remind the doctor that this is also an issue. Put it put it back on the table if it if it falls off the side out of focus. So the three of you have had very, very different experiences or approaches to exploring uh, deep brain stimulation as a treatment. So I'd like to 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 hear your thoughts. So maybe I will start with Eve. So could you just tell us sort of about your, your experience with deep brain stimulation? Whoa. <laughs> Eva. Mm. Alors, uh, ça a été vraiment, uh, je pense, fait aussi un peu tard. Yves a bénéficié de cette opération tardivement, je pense. Uh, ça a été uh, dû au Covid, déjà. Uh, ça a été quand même une aventure assez difficile pour lui parce qu'il est arrivé dans un état qui était vraiment très difficile, très avancé. Et alors, l'opération en elle-même, c'est toute une aventure et je pense que là, je ne peux pas retranscrire ce que Yves a vécu uh, uh, lors de cette opération. Mais ce que je pourrais dire c'est que ça a pris beaucoup plus de temps que prévu et que ce n'a pas été aussi miraculeux que ce qu'on pouvait s'attendre. C'est sûr que c'était incroyable au niveau de la dyskinésie, Yves. On avait un Yves tout beau, tout droit, tout beau, tout... mais avec déjà des difficultés à communiquer. Il était vraiment beaucoup plus calme, il se sentait mieux, mais... Malheureusement, euh, on peut le dire maintenant avec euh, quelques, une année euh, de retard, de, après l'opération, euh, que les symptômes euh, quant à son élocution sont vraiment très, très forts et que euh, ça, ça a atténué certains symptômes, mais d'autres symptômes sont venus euh, se rajouter peut-être. C'est juste ce que je te dis, Yves. Oui, je peux un peu... Cette personne veut examiner le Parkinson que, que j'ai parce que quand je peux faire des choses, ben, il y a des gens qui le font, qui, qui, qui vient pour me faire. Je, alors, c'est, je, je voulais témoigner, mais sachant que je suis dans un de, 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 de con, con conseil. Bon, euh, ça, 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 ça me dit, me dit pas de part. Voilà, le fond, je, 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 euh, 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 non, euh, là, je voulais euh, passer. Je, je, 
c'est des, des, des choses. Je, je peux faire possible. Parce que je suis. Alors, can you? You can. So, um, for the surgery, actually, it has been a long adventure for him because he was supposed to have the surgery far before, but due to the COVID, it has been a delay. And then he get uh, the surgery that was by itself an adventure. Um, and basically after the operation, he recovered very well. So all the dyskinesia was gone. He could walk very well and everything actually in terms of motor symptom really decreased and slowed down. And that uh, he really appreciated. So for a couple of months, that was great for the family, the friends. He flied really, he recovered very well. But then all of a sudden, actually the situation get worse because new symptoms arrive and one of the most obvious symptoms is the lack of ability of FIV now to speak. So it completely loses the capacity to speak, but also to open a computer, it's not possible for him now. He cannot type a message or an email. Even doing a WhatsApp is super complicated. He cannot answer to his phone. So basically, indeed, you have, have less motor symptoms, but overall, the connection with people or communication with people is completely lost in all the way. So personal way when you meet friends and family, but also just by the new technology that you cannot use, such as Google search, uh, emails exchange, or WhatsApp. So that has been very difficult for everybody. Voilà. Bonsoir. Je m'appelle Maya et je suis la maman à Yves. Et depuis des années, donc je vous parle, ce qui me vient maintenant, c'est mon cœur qui parle. Euh, depuis 18-20 ans, je sais qu'il est atteint de la maladie de Parkinson. Et puis les petites premières années étaient bien, très bien. Il a tout de suite réagi bien. Il a su que chaque moment de sa vie va être important. Et puis, il a entrepris des choses que j'ai trouvées admirables parce qu'il a décidé, comme toujours, c'est un volontaire, c'est un ancien sportif et il croche jusqu'au dernier moment. Et puis, alors, ce qu'il a fait au début, c'était magnifique. Par la suite, c'est encore plus magnifique parce que, bon, je suis sa maman mais ce qu'on vit tous les jours, je suis tous les jours avec lui. Et puis, euh, malheureusement, on a des conditions pas confortables, point de vue, on n'habite pas dans la même maison. J'ai aussi euh, mon mari qui a besoin de moi. Et puis, euh, Yves, c'est mon amour. J'ai aussi un autre fils que j'aime tout autant, différemment, parce qu'il est en pleine forme et il a une famille et c'est notre joie. Et puis, Yves... Il me remplit tous les jours le cœur de bonheur. Mais, 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 le plus grand handicap, vous l'avez vu dans le film, là, il bougeait très mal. Maintenant, il bouge mieux. Il y a même des amis qui me disent, ah, j'ai vu ton fils et il va bien. Je l'ai croisé en ville. Il est super. C'est vrai, il est super. Par contre, ce qui me, vraiment, que maintenant, me touche, c'est son manque d'éducation. On ne peut plus parler ensemble. On a la peine à se comprendre et ça, c'est le plus grand handicap qui le touche en ce moment et qui touche toute notre famille parce que c'est vrai que ça, ça a un impact sur tout l'entourage. Heureusement, il a des amis chers qui sont un qui valent de l'or et puis euh, moi, je fais mon possible mais ces temps, j'arrive à dire que je suis presque au bout de mes capacités de gérer tous les jours, même mon âge avançant, et puis j'ai de la chance d'être aussi toujours sportif, que j'ai cette même mentalité de vouloir aller au bout, mais ces temps, c'est très difficile. Alors, autant lui que moi, on entend à travers une médication plus efficace, quelque chose qui arrive, et ça n'arrivait pas, ça n'arrivait pas, ça n'arrivait pas. C'est des années qui passent. 
qui sont tellement difficiles. Et puis, on attendait beaucoup, beaucoup de l'opération qui était bien. Ça lui a enlevé ses skinésies, ça lui a enlevé son freezing. Mais encore maintenant, il arrive dans une période où malheureusement, on n'a pas su faire, c'est ma faute aussi, je n'ai pas su gérer assez régulièrement sa médication. C'est ça le plus grand, la, la plus grande faute qu'on a fait. On avait des contrôles régulièrement du juve, les scientifiques et les médecins que j'ai connus sont fantastiques. Je les remercie pour tout leur travail, je ne sais pas comment dire mieux. Mais par contre, là maintenant, moi je pense qu'il est en ce moment intoxiqué par les médicaments qu'il a pris déjà deux, trois années en avant, avant le défi, avant l'opération, qui était énorme. Et puis après, il a dû attendre six mois pour se faire opérer. Et pendant ces six mois, encore, les médicaments continuent. Et puis maintenant, après l'opération, maintenant, en ce moment, c'est que pendant deux ou trois, pire, trois semaines, je dirais deux mois, j'ai toujours fait confiance à Yves, et il le sait, et j'ai pensé qu'il pouvait prendre ses médicaments. Et maintenant, ce qu'il doit prendre, il doit le prendre juste. Le matin, à 10 h à midi, à 16 h avec des réguliers. Et ça, il ne peut plus faire. Alors, en voyant ça, on a des amis qui ont débarqué chez lui. Moi aussi, je voyais qu'il n'était plus sous contrôle. Alors, maintenant, on arrive à un stade où, malheureusement, je suis malheureux de le dire. Et il le sait. J'ai dit que je vais le dire. C'est difficile. C'est à tel point difficile qu'on ne sait pas comment gérer la prochaine semaine, demain, ce sera un autre jour, la semaine prochaine et la suite. Aucune idée. On ne sait pas. Naya, maybe I stop. We translate because there is a lot that you say or you say. Si tu veux transmettre, oui, volontiers, malheureusement. So basically, Maya just said that uh, she was speaking from the heart and she's the mom of Eve and it's 18 years, 20 years that just she's living with Eve, not in the same house though, but she's accompanying uh, Eve on daily basis with his disease. And basically, it's now more and more difficult. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot translate every word. But, um, and basically, they had a lot of hope with the operation. But after the surgery, actually, with the difficulties of Eve, the worst part for Maya is to have lost the capacity of communicating with her son. And that has been actually one of the most impactful problems after the surgery in your life, that uh, she cannot communicate with her son on a daily basis. Uh, she cannot necessarily understand what he needs, what he wants to say. And um, two days, actually, so far, she has left Eve dealing with um, his medicamentation on a daily basis, but she realized that now she also has to check that uh, because there is a lot of uh, issues for Eve to take on time the medicamentation several times a day. And that is really difficult for a mom because she's getting aged and uh, she'd like also to take care of her husband who needs her and actually to be uh, side by side uh, with Eve uh, most of the day actually which complicates her life actually a lot and um, so, and voilà and so that maybe, is yeah. very difficult for Maya. So I'll, uh, maybe we'll go to, to Gina since you went through this journey and and opted not to go through DBS. Could you just share some of your thoughts? Sure. Um, before delving into that, I really appreciate hearing uh, Maya's words now because my, I've just moved back home after being in Canada for 10 years and I'm living around my family members and they haven't seen me this long, you know, for this, this duration of time in, in a decade. And during that time, I came down with Parkinson's and I've been living with it for about, I think, Five, how many years? Five or five and a half years now. So there, it's it's in it's. This is one thing, one other thing, one of many things that's different between the two different communities: the young the young onset community and the um, the traditional onset. I guess um, most of our parents are still alive, so it's it, it's a whole other dynamic. Older people that I that I know in Vancouver, 
their spouses were their, their main support system or their children. Um, but now we have, Ben and I especially, we have parents that are, that are still pretty young and they, um, they don't know what, you know, whether they should go back in parent mode or if to respect our autonomy. It's, it's really, it's impacting them um, probably more, more than it's impacting us right now. <laughs> so I just, I really, I think, I don't know if it's a very well studied area, but um, I think more focus needs to be given to the parents and the people with young onset and their needs too. It's, it's, it's still different from the needs of other friends and family. It's between a parent and a child. And, and that's, that's something that was a theme in the, in the short film that we saw um, with oh, my mother, I don't think was in there. I don't know, they, that must have gotten out in the edit, but if you watch the longer version of the film and the, the seven part series um, below, like in the, in the same area where the link is, um, you can see an interview with my mother and the pain, you can, you can see the pain that it causes her watching her child go through this. Even though I'm 44 years old, my mother still feels pain and guilt and everything, all the things that a parent feels and fear, um, all the things that a parent feels when their kids are suffering. So, but other than that, for D, as far as DBS goes, that's, that's what the longer version of the film is about. It's focusing on whether I should do DBS or not, is this the appropriate time, whether it would address all of my symptoms. And I chose not to do it. Um, I did go through the, the full assessment. I was about, the, at the time where I was about to schedule the surgery, put it on the calendar. And that's one of the reasons I came back East because I planned on having surgery and having uh, family take care of me for a couple months. Um, just much easier <laughs> to do this with a support system around than it would be in Vancouver when I don't have any friend, uh, family. So. I for various reasons, I chose not to do it. Uh, I'm not ruling it out for the future, but um, it's, it, see, I think seeing the photos that Ben would send me every time he was, you know, pulling another bandage off his head, he looked like Frankenstein. I mean, that, that just, I think it scared the heck out of me. And, um, but it's right, it's nice to see long-term how it's changed Ben's life and given him his freedom back. And so it's, I could see it's, it's a cost benefit decision that everybody has to make. There are risks associated with it. Um, there's also like a chance that the, the results won't live up to our expectations. And um, I think I need to spend more time figuring out personally, um, what's the difference between my symptoms? Is it, it, I, have, I have stress tremors and I have Parkinsonian tremors. So if I do DBS and it addresses the Parkinsonian tremors, I'll still have stress, stress tremors. So. Um, the DBS won't address the non-motor symptoms that I have, like uh, extreme anxiety and constipation. So, you, you know, it's, it's a cost-benefit decision. Ben, can you briefly share sort of what would you recommend for a Parkinson's patient today? Um, so what I would recommend for a patient, uh, that's a very difficult question because every one of us is different and every one of us experiences disease in different ways. Um, but for me, I mean, DBS has saved my life. I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't be here today. I mean, I, I, I might still be alive in the world somewhere, but I wouldn't be able to travel. Um, I wouldn't be able to do the things I'm doing right now with my life, if not for the deep brain stimulator that I inserted last June. However, I, I realize that also I'm very much an exception to the rule because for, for a lot of different reasons, but, um, the biggest was that. I know my clinical team very, very well, and they know me very, very well. And there's one man in particular, Alfonso Bazzano, who took, he's my neurologist back in Toronto. He's one of the best DBS programmers in the world. And he spent an inordinate amount of time with me, making sure that my simulations were properly set up. And then he, we also have the best, one of the best surgical teams in the world in Toronto. So without, and then on top of all of those things, I also have my family back home. So without each of those three like things in place that were all like doting on me and making sure that I had all the support that I needed, I would not have, rec I would not have gone through DBS. And I wouldn't recommend it to patients who don't have a great family environment to go home to, the best surgical team in the world, and that programmer who knows you very well. I know, I've known mine for almost seven years now. I was diagnosed nine years ago. And having that relationship with him, that's what has enabled me to, I think, be here today. Because DBS, it, it, there's a lot that I could say about the procedure itself, but one thing to notice is that I also have the adaptive system. 
the new one from Medtronic. So it's reading out my beta waves and it's correlating that with my symptom severity and it's giving me the, the appropriate amount of simulation that I need at any moment of the day. Um, now, the reason why I was chosen for that, the reason why I'm in this, it, it's still a clinical trial. So there's some things in there that I can't say quite yet, but that'll be hopefully finishing pretty soon. And then once it finishes, I'll be able to speak a little bit more freely about everything that I've gone through and the procedure itself. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answered your question. But yeah, so I think we'll, we're, we're about to close this session. So I'd like to ask Ignacio, Gina, and Eve if your final message is to the scientific community and to new Parkinson to, to patients. So can you give it to Eve? I mean, sorry, to Ignacio. Can you repeat the question? Your final message. What is my message to the scientific to, community? To the scientific people, community. Yes. Well, there's a couple of things. I think um, for me, you know, I, I presume there's a lot of scientists in the audience, right? And I don't know how you how you feel about your work, but there are many times I think doing research where you feel like you're not advancing a lot and you're not getting recognition and you feel frustrated. And um, for me, the best antidote was starting to do humanitarian work and helping people and interacting with the patients because. Um, there is a lack of communication and engagement and understanding in both directions about how difficult science is, what it takes, and the people who are doing the research, and vice versa. How important it is for the patients to understand and to know that there are people that care about them, for you to make an effort to connect with them and learn about the disease from the people who are affected rather than from textbooks. Um, so my, my biggest recommendation, because I think it will help your scientific career and your psychology and motivation is go out there. And sometimes the simplest things are the things that matter the most. For me at the beginning, it was, I made the effort to go to Colombia, Venezuela. Nobody from outside ever went to see them. And I would just sit with them. I would hold their hands and I would talk. And for them, this was extraordinarily meaningful and it gave them hope that there's a lot of people out there who are thinking about this problem so something as simple as that it can be can be really life-changing for a lot of people and for yourself so uh so get involved each alors je vais peut-être juste dire ce qu'on avait dit avec Yves et Maya lundi soir par rapport à ça c'est exactement ce que vous dites la communication les échanges en fait pas être juste en passion euh, et peut-être un chercheur ou un médecin, mais vraiment qu'il y a un, un, un échange entre tout ça parce qu'on ne mesure pas, euh, on ne mesure pas le, la vie quotidienne d'un Parkinsonien. Et je crois, Yves le dit très souvent, il y a autant de gens que de Parkinson. Il y a tellement de Parkinson différents. Euh, vous n'avez certainement pas le même Parkinson. Euh, chaque personne a son propre Parkinson. J'ai encore personnellement ma marraine qui a aussi Parkinson et et c'est complètement différent de Yves. Donc, euh, en fait, c'est vraiment ça, c'est d'être dans, dans les pas du patient depuis le moment où il se brosse les dents jusqu'au moment où il se couche le soir et euh, de voir, en fait, cette, ce quotidien. Quoi. Et puis, évidemment, ben, secrètement, ben, mon, je parle en tant qu'ami, mais c'est évidemment ben, trouver le miracle. Trouver nous, un, un, Yves, il, dit, il me dit souvent ça. Si j'avais eu un cancer, on aurait trouvé de quoi me guérir. Voilà. Je vous ai pesé peut-être mais il faut vous ici que moi je suis j'ai 18 ans de, de, de Parkinson donc ça, 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 ça fait un, un, un c'est pas, pas le, le, le chemin enfin, je, je vois là, là, ça, 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 après, après cinq années de, 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 de j'entends j'entends qui qui qu ça ça ça, 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 ça enfin, là, le, là, en fait, au début, ça fait 18 ans que tu as Parkinson. Les cinq premières années, elles étaient presque confortables. 
Euh, C'était mon coach. On a fait des marathons ensemble. <rire> il a toujours été très sportif. Ça ne se voyait pas. Il y avait des symptômes peut-être qui étaient plus, justement, comme disait Gina, on ne voit pas forcément peut-être une dépression ou hein, tu avais des raideurs dans oui. la main. Oui, oui. Puis des, 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 je ne sais pas. Je, 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 de, de, je, de, 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 j'ai commencé à vous faire voir des, 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 voir, voir du, du, des, des mondes de, dans ma maladie de, 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 de ma maladie j'ai faisais, faisais des, des, des problèmes de 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 à des hallucinations. Voilà. Donc, ça, ça vient surtout la nuit. C'est très, très angoissant. Ouais, depuis, euh, ça, ça, ça ces dernières années. Pardon. Le dernier mois, ouais. surtout là. Oui, il y avait nouveau. déjà avant l'opération. Oui, oui. Il y avait avant et puis maintenant, euh, depuis un mois, ça c'est vraiment beaucoup de voilà. Il bouge aussi de nouveau plus, euh, un gros changement. On attend euh, depuis euh, toutes les vacances, juillet, août. Dernier rendez-vous était juillet, euh, début juillet. Et puis, au fond, je comprends très bien que tout le monde doit prendre des vacances, mais Yves, il a besoin, moi aussi, absolument, qu'on a ce contact, qu'on voit les médicaments, si c'est juste euh, ce qu'il prend. Et puis, euh, il faut surveiller... Euh, Cinq fois par jour, matin tôt, euh, même 11 heures le soir. Alors, au fond, euh, les, les proches aidantes, alors, justement, moi qui, qui est souvent avec Yves, alors, au fond, on est vraiment dans un. On ne sait pas. On sait pas. Enfin, je, on verra maintenant, parce qu'il y a plein. Ils disent toujours, mais il y a le CMS, c'est comme ça. Ils se donnent tous la peine, mais on ne peut pas. Ce n'est pas une vieille personne. Ce n'est pas une personne âgée qui est à la maison, qui ne peut plus bouger. Lui, Yves, il a encore envie de se lever le matin, même s'il ne peut pas tenir toute une journée. Et tout à coup, il est fatigué. Et on ne peut plus. On peut plus. En ce moment, c'est vraiment. C'est trop difficile, on ne peut pas vous dire différemment. C'est trop difficile parce qu'au fond, il s'endort aussi beaucoup. Parce que tout à coup, euh, il a, alors il dort une heure et demie, mais pas ici, mais tout à coup à la maison, on ne peut plus fixer rendez-vous. C'est tous des détails, mais ils sont tellement lourds. Et puis maintenant, il aimerait tellement encore vous parler, et puis être avec vous, et comme ça, il est, il est, il est muré dans un... Il est vraiment emmuré dans, dans lui. Et euh, voilà. Et puis on, on se change les idées comme on peut, et un petit peu, en marchant. Là, marcher, puis encore bien marcher. Et puis ça aussi. Alors, positive, voilà, j'espère. Mais j'attends un rendez-vous au CHUV. On a deux rendez-vous. J'attends aussi qu'il est d'accord de suivre correctement une ergothérapie, un peu euh, physio aussi, parce que. Ça, c'est tous des détails qui sont tellement importants. Et puis, pour ça, il n'est pas... C'est son point faible. Je vais essayer de traduire les trois parties sans oublier quelque chose. La première chose, en fait, c'est que Christine était disant, comme une amie, qu'en fait, elle est 100% d'accord avec Ignacio et l'importance de faire un exchange entre les scientifiques et les patients, parce que la plupart des gens dehors ne comprennent pas ce qu'est le Parkinson et ce que ça signifie aussi de vivre avec les symptômes de Parkinson. Je vais faire un petit peu plus de Parkinson. I make it brief, huh? It's, uh, try to, to make it short. <laughs> and then Eve and Christine debates about the evolution of the symptom. And the fact is during the five years, um, Eve didn't have barely any symptom that were visible and he could live very well with that is I think what is called the honeymoon of the disease. And, but actually it evolved and actually the frustration now after the surgery, he has new symptoms. So we spoke about the communication, but actually there is more, there is a lot of cognitive decline right now with hallucination and loss of memory. And that is very difficult for him to accept the new symptom. 
And finally, Maya uh, was saying that as the mom, as the person who takes care of Eve on a daily basis, actually she is now reaching the point that they discuss about the possibility for Eve to go in a center, but usually this medical center is for old people and Eve is not old. And actually he wants to go outside, he wants to still work and he wants still to live. And it's very difficult right now actually to find this compromise between um, the frustration of Eve with the lack of communication, with the impairment of his life, and to find a solution for him to still have a normal life at his age, but with someone who can also take over the responsibility of looking after Eve, because his mom needs to be here every hour or almost every day with him, and it's too much for her and she cannot handle that. They are waiting for a month, uh, an appointment to the hospital, but they cannot get. And in between, he declined more and more. So there is a lot of frustration right now. And, uh, and voila. Thank you very much. We'll close with comments from Gina on your message to the scientists. Sure, I'll be brief. Um, mainly just involve patients in, in the process, the research process. <clears throat> That's what Ben's discussion was pretty much focusing on. Um, so I don't want to rehash that, but, and more of a practical note for clinicians or even researchers when doing a, um, clinical trials, don't, when a patient walks into the office, especially if they have Parkinson and they're really symptomatic, their motor symptoms is really symptomatic, don't hand them a stack of papers and I ask them to fill it out by hand. <laughs> Thank you very much, and thank you very much to all of you for, for being with us today, for taking the time to, to come here, share your experiences, and really uh, reveal for us the complexity and the human face for, of these diseases. Thank you. We'll take a 15 minute break, and then we have a, a final session on updates on the latest advances in developing therapies, how far have we come, and how far we still have to go. Thank you again for your attention. And Okay, I think we're ready to start the, <clears throat> the next session focusing on Sort of getting an update on where we stand today with respect to developing therapies for neurodegenerative diseases. We have invited a panel of experts and people who are involved in clinical trials and drug development from different organizations and pharmaceutical industry. And I'm pleased to start this session with uh, a talk by Dr. Simon Stott. He's the Director of Research at Cure Parkinson's Disease. Many of you in the Parkinson field know Simon also through his uh, blog called Science of Parkinson's Disease. And those of you who are not aware of this, I advise you to look it up. It's, he provides constantly the most up-to-date information about both the basic the translational and, and uh, science aspect of Parkinson's disease in in the best way they can be summarized. So he's with us today to give us uh, sort of some reflections from his position as the director of Cure Parkinson's and his involvement in a number of committees, uh, you know, uh, looking at promising drugs for Parkinson's disease and views where we stand and where we go. Thanks for joining us, Simon, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alal. 
and um, bonsoir tout le monde. Good, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for that kind introduction and also for um, inviting me to speak tonight. I'm just going to quickly share my slides. And what I'd like to do is provide you with a short and sweet um, overview of uh, how far we've come and uh, how far we still have to go with regards to Parkinson's and the treating of uh, neurodegenerative conditions. Um, so full disclosure, I, uh, am a, I work for Cure Parkinson's as Halal has suggested. And um, what I'd like to do is start by firstly just putting a bit of context to the talk uh, in terms of how far we have come. Uh, a slide I always like to use to um, explain this to uh, lay audiences is this one here. So across the bottom, we have um, the years, that is from 1817, which was when uh, James Parkinson first described the condition, through to this year, 2022. And up the left-hand and right-hand side, you have the number of publications or the number of research reports that have been published with the keyword Parkinson's. And what you notice is for the first 100, 150 years, there wasn't much activity uh, going across from 1870 towards 2020. To, and then all of a sudden we have sort of like a um, climate uh, graph where the temperature is going up. We have a huge number of publications being produced with the keyword Parkinson's. And um, an important feature of this graph is that 80% of all the research reports that have been written on Parkinson's have been published since the year, two, excuse me, 2000. So that's 125,000 of the 155 odd thousand research reports have been produced since the turn of the century. And this year alone, we're probably going to have another 12,000 um, research reports on Parkinson's. So an obvious question, people could ask is what has happened in the last 20 years. Um, and the positive note here is there have been huge developments with regards to new treatments for Parkinson's, symptomatic treatments these are. You can see um, on this graph going across the bottom again is years, and I've stolen this from the Michael J. Fox Foundation. It's a fantastic uh, image, and I hope uh, Jamie and any of her colleagues in the audience don't mind <laughs> me borrowing it. Um, but you can see across the bottom, there are years. And in the 1960s, um, there wasn't very much with regards to treatments for Parkinson's. And then in the 1970s, we had the development of L-DOPA and um, dopamine agonists. So we had a big bump in uh, progress there. But then after the year 2000, all of a sudden, we start to see this um, rocket ship to the moon in terms of uh, new iterations and developments in terms of some of these uh, symptomatic therapies. And another important aspect of what's happened in the last 20 years is that in 1997, um, genetic variations, so these are tiny errors in our DNA, uh, in a region of the DNA that provides the instructions for a particular protein called alpha-synuclein, it is, it sounds like a distant galaxy, but it's one of the most um, common proteins in our brain. So tiny, tiny errors in the, in the section of DNA that provides the instructions for making alpha synuclein became associated with an increased risk of Parkinson's. And this got the research community really excited because all of a sudden, after 200 years since James first described the condition, we had our first real sort of insight into the potential biology underlying the condition. And the excitement built over the next couple of years because additional genetic risk factors were um, discovered. We have about 80 to 90 uh, genetic risk factors associated with increased risk of Parkinson's now. And for the last 20 years, there's been a um, flurry of activity, huge resources being applied to better understanding the biology of all of these risk factors. What, is, how, what, 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 is this, what uh, biological processes are associated with these risk factors and can we manipulate them? So for the first 10 years of the century, 
we were focused on understanding the associated biology of these risk factors, building tools to test theories and trying to characterize the protein and um, biological pathways that were associated with these risk factors. And for the last 10 years, we've been identifying and developing novel therapies based on that biology and our understanding of that biology. And what we're at right now is a very exciting period of time where we're actually clinically testing our understanding and our theories around this biology. So this is this for, for research scientists in the audience, this is a really, really exciting time to be a research scientist because for the, for the last 20 years, we've been building up these theories of these ideas about the biology of Parkinson's or this, this condition that we refer to as Parkinson's. And now we are finally testing, um, clinically testing therapies that could potentially slow down the progression of the condition. And I just want to give you a couple of examples of this um, clinical testing, uh, one of which is in your very backyard in uh, Lausanne. There is a biotech company called AC Immune, and they are currently um, initiating a phase two clinical trial for a vaccine targeting that protein I was talking about, alpha-synucleum. So the idea is that this vaccine, similar to the vaccine that we've all had for COVID, this vaccine, instead of targeting a virus, will be targeting this protein alpha-synuclein and seeing if um, by reducing the amount of alpha-synuclein we have can slow down the progression of the condition. Uh, another interesting clinical trial program that's going on um, as we speak at the moment has been developed by a comp biotech company called Denali with their partners at Biogen, the pharmaceutical company. And this involves LARC2 inhibition. So LARC2 is a protein that becomes very active or hyperactive in um, some people with Parkinson's. And Denali and a lot of other biotech companies have been developing uh, drugs that will dampen down that hyperactive form of LARC2 and Denali and um, Biogen now have two clinical trials initiating. One is called the Lighthouse Study. It's a phase three clinical trial. Phase three being the final step before you go to the regulators to have a drug approved. This is the, 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 the last hurdle, the, the big test for a medication. And then there's also the Luma Study. And the difference between these two studies is that the Lighthouse study is focused on individuals who actually have a genetic risk factor for the, um, in terms of LARC2. And the LUMA study is looking at people with just spontaneous Parkinson's or idiopathic Parkinson's. So these people do not have um, a genetic form of or a genetic risk factor for Parkinson's. So these are two very exciting clinical trials that are ongoing at the moment. And if you want to learn more about a lot of clinical activity uh, so clinical trial activity going on for Parkinson's. I highly recommend you look at um, the work of Dr. Kevin McFarthing and Sue Buff. So Kevin here in England runs what's called the Hope List, uh, where he's keeping track of all the new developments in clinical trials and also preclinical work as well. And Sue out in California keeps um, maintains the PD trial tracker, a large database, uh, also keeping track of the, uh, all the clinical trials. And here at um, Cure Parkinson's, we also put out a yearly report, an annual report that uh, provides an overview of all the drug therapies being developed for Parkinson's. And Kevin is the, the lead on that project. And as you can see on this image here, uh, on the top half of the circle is therapies to being developed for disease modification. And on the bottom half of the circle is new therapies being developed for symptomatic therapy. Uh, and there is a lot going on at the moment, and we are very keen to see uh, an increase in the number of phase three clinical trials, so the central circle, in terms of disease modification for Parkinson's. So that's a bit of um, where we've come from and uh, what is happening at the moment. But um, now we're going to shift very quickly to how far we still have to go. And for a lot of people in the audience with Parkinson's, the main, um, the main desire is for the whole research process to speed up. They don't want to hear that there's a new drug being tested and it's going to take 10 years for it to be um, investigated and approved. Uh, and one way we're trying to achieve 
this speeding up of the uh, trial process is with the um, Edmund J. Safra Act PD platform. So this is a project where we are um, trying to accelerate clinical trial pro trials in Parkinson's. And it's using a plat we're building a platform which, which what is called a NAMS um, platform. That's a multi-arm, multi-stage design clinical trial setup. So typically with the clinical trials, what you have is a placebo being tested against one treatment. And you'll start the study and you'll finish the study, you'll analyze the results, and then you'll go away and you'll publish the results and everyone will be excited or disappointed, depending on what the results tell you. Uh, it's a very long and costly process because each time you start a clinical trial, it's a bit like building a football stadium. And then you come to the end of the trial and you dismantle the football stadium and then you go and build a football stadium somewhere else. What the MAMS uh, platform will do is, well, it will be a continual, excuse me, it will be a continual conveyor belt of drugs um, being tested. There'll be no, there will be, if a drug, um, if a treatment demonstrates signs of efficacy, it will continue to be tested. If a treatment doesn't show signs of a positive result, it'll be stopped and a new treatment will be tested. So there'll be no, um, there'll be no stopping a clinical trial, analyzing the results and then waiting to see what happens. This will just be a continuous process of constantly testing new treatments uh, all the way from phase two to phase three um, clinical testing. So it, 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 um, it's a very exciting period of time and um, hopefully this will speed up the uh, clinical trial process. But then the question becomes, um, how can we measure Parkinson's and, uh, and know that we're actually slowing or stopping it? The old tools that we currently have, um, such as the clinical rating scales, they're not very precise um, in terms of uh, the details that we're looking for with uh, Parkinson's. And then there's questions as to what we should be measuring and how we should be measuring them so that we're not disrupting uh, the lives of patients. We don't want to burden them with too many um, uh, requirements. And in addition to this, the clinical trials that we currently run are focused on an average patient. We are looking for drugs that can um, help an average patient. And everybody in the audience will know that there is no such thing as an average patient. The, so an important goal for the future of Parkinson's research will be personalizing treatment. Uh, each case of Parkinson's has very individual needs and um, requirements, and we need to uh, start shifting the, the mindset towards th this goal. Uh, do, going after the average patient is easy. Individualizing treatment is very hard, but just because something is hard doesn't mean we should not do it. So um, yeah, so this, 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 is what, this is one area that we need to start focusing on going forward. And uh, finally, I'd like just to point out that there is a great disconnect within uh, research where the goals of the scientists and the needs of the patient are very disconnected, they're very separate things. The scientists are focused on uh, making great uh, scientific discoveries and publishing in them high, in high impact journals and, and winning a prize in order to um, secure their uh, career progress and uh, keep a job, keep bread on the table. Whereas patients um, are much more focused on uh, the, their individual requirements and um, surviving to see another day, I suppose. And what we really require is um, a great need for more engagement from both the patient and the research communities, uh, the building of bridges, as uh, this image suggests. So I'm gonna stop there and just um, quickly summarize by pointing out that there has been a tremendous amount of progress in terms of the treatment of Parkinson's. And there's a lot of exciting therapeutic approaches now being applied um, to the development of future therapies, not just symptomatic, but also potentially disease modifying therapies. The major challenge lying ahead is um, actually slowing the condition down and, and understanding what we should be measuring uh, in order to judge if we are actually slowing the condition down. 
uh, more patient uh, more um, patient and research uh, engagement is required and a special focus for any young scientists in the room should be um, focusing on the personalizing of the treatment which is a key goal going forward and i'll say thank you very much Thank you very much. And on the theme of Parkinson, we'll continue with an update from Roche. And our guest speaker for this is Dr. Gennaro Pagano. He's the medical director of Parkinson disease at Roche, Switzerland. So. Hi. I see something on the screen, okay. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor and a pleasure to speak to you today. I'm trying to summarize some of the learnings we had by running one of the latest clinical trials. Probably you read about that, it was published in New England a few, few weeks ago. So this is my disclosure. I work at Roche, I'm a movement disorder expert, and uh, I spend half of my life trying to diagnose and treat patients in UK mostly, uh, Imperial King's College, and then since four years, I'm at Roche trying to develop drugs and running phase two, phase three, eventually also phase one with new drugs. So we know that it's complex and Scott, a very nice uh, presentation. We try to simplify sometimes how Parkinson is, and then I like the approach discussed before about it's not one disease, more complicated than that. And there are several approaches, right, that help to identify treatments. We think, and I think uh, I really spend a lot of time trying to develop diagnostic tool to understand what's happening in the brain, right, in the past with pet tracer or fluid biomarkers, but everything starts from the patient, from the met need. So what is actually not working? And every patient is different. So we need to kind of group them and understand. And there are many initiatives since many years that are trying to do that, kind of redefine what Parkinson is or what Parkinson disease are. And then we should try to go on a precision medicine approach, right? Understanding what's happening in that brain or that group of people. And then with companion diagnostic, what we call like we have a tool, a pet tracer or fluid biomarker, something that you can measure in the body of the patient. And then we could move, and I, I like, you know, this was presented also before, rather than looking at just the clinical, we could have day-to-day -day data, right? Digital tool allow that. And then eventually we can do virtual trials, which you could measure the patient on the day-to-day -day activity at home. Because when you go to the clinic, many of you, you know, experience that other as a patient or still caregiver or as a doctor, it's not the real thing, right? You can see something, maybe the patient is worse on the day. And then it's not, you know, the trial have some weird results. We don't know how to interpret them. So only with continuous data, we'll be able to, to find eventually something. And of course, at the end, improve patient quality of life. So from patient to patient, this is the aim, right? In practice, this is difficult. And I share, I share some learning about the study that I was running in the last years, is the Pasadena study. In this study, we tested uh, immunotherapy, so something that is infusing to the body of the patient to bind alpha-synuclein. I think Scott sh uh, showed sh uh, so show before that in 1997, there was this big discovery. Synuclein was considered one of the driver of Parkinson, at least associated with Parkinson, because it's present in the brain when people are dead, in the it was so-called Levy bodies. And there are people that have genetic mutation on this, that develop Parkinson 100% with their, during their life, even early onset. I mean, maybe this is not true for everyone, right? And this is something that push a lot, 20 years of work. And in 2020, this study started, right? So it was actually 18. So it took approximately 20 years from the 1997 discovery. In this study, we tested uh, three groups. A group of people received placebo, like an infusion with the saline, right? With nothing in it and the other two groups receive either low or high dose of the drug. This is the first part of the study, one year. And then everyone that accepted to do the study had the opportunity to move on the treatment. In the second part, you see part two. There are people that everyone that received placebo then receive also prasinetumab, either low or high dose. And then we analyze the data at the end of the first year and then at the end of the second year. 
And after that, everyone continue, we decided to give access to the drug for another five years after that, because we saw, I'm gonna show you this later, some result that might tell us that the drug might have some effect. We don't know exactly if it's true, if it's a real effect, or if it's actually strong enough, but we want to keep and give the opportunity to patients to have a longer term treatment. Because if you long, after five years, you don't develop motor complication, cognitive impairment, maybe the drug is actually working. And we will only discover over time, right? This is another problem of trials. They need to last much longer than the time that we actually have. So, I mean, we discuss is a pretty technical, just to show briefly, there is something in the brain called sinuglin, as I said before. And then the, the prasinezuma, that is the compound that we tested, is able to bind these uh, aggregates, right? It's like kind of little bubble, little stones that are damaging the neurons. And we think that if you do that, this could have an effect, right, on the progression of the disease. This is uh, the end point. I mean, just to say, we measure many things. The primary end point of the study was the combination of all the symptoms, from sleep to constipation to tremor, and also how do people report how they feel, their function. We also measure individual component of the, of the study. One thing I want to highlight today is that we look, we pre-specified some group of people that could eventually benefit more of the drug because we knew from other studies that people that are what's so-called diffuse malignant, right? They have some symptoms at baseline before they start the study that predict that they would progress much faster than other people. Because another key important element, right? Why we run phase two studies, a phase two study, is to learn what the drug is potentially able to do it. It's not as fine a study to register and then give the, 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 the drug to the patient. It's just to learn and then design better trial afterwards. So in this study, we wanted to test, is the drug is gonna work more or the same in a group of people that progress faster? And we, you know, this is data uh, from uh, the PPMI study on the, on the right hand side that is basically a long observation study. And we saw that over the first year, the only part of the scale that we use as a primary endpoint that changed in one year was part three. So basically the clinician rating of the symptoms of the patient, like tremor, slowness, stiffness, the other two parts that are part of our primary endpoint that are the non-motor experience of daily living and the motor experience of daily living, like how do you dress yourself, how do you eat, and et cetera, they were not changing much over one year. And then when we look at our study, we evaluate all together. Unfortunately, we did not see an effect, and you probably read online, there, were, there are many articles on it. We did see that there were no different in adverse event between the low and placebo, so it's pretty similar. With the high dose, there were some higher infusion related reaction. It's basically when people receive the drug, they start having some flushing, some symptoms that they feel uh, kind of, you know, an allergic reaction, let's say, but was always in the mind that we see grade one or two. So they disappear without need of medication. Just in one case, there was a need of, of a medication. But so basically the drug is pretty safe, right? In both doses, but low dose, very similar to placebo. But if you see on the, on the right hand side, there was no separation, right? This would tell us, okay, let's stop everything. But if you look deeper, and this is what, I, what we did actually, we, we evaluated the three components of the scale. It's a, it's a sum of three components, part one, part two, and part three. If you look at part one, you can see that the threshold for minimal clinical important difference, right? What we call relevant for the patient. There are many studies that say that is 2.45 points for part one was not even reached. Right, within a range of one point, we did not see a big difference, right? Actually, there is nothing there. And same for part two. Actually, part two changed uh, slightly above the, the threshold, but still we're talking about a couple of points. I don't know if you're familiar with the scale when you go to the doctor, when you see, it's like you say, I feel slightly or mild, you, you know, you have uh, one point. So if you have two symptoms that move from slightly to mild, you move two points. And there is a huge variability, you see, from the scale. So what we did then, as I was pre-specified, right? We also look at the motor progression measured by the clinician. And then there we, we saw a separation, right? Some sort of 25% separation. I mean, it still is not huge. I mean, people still progress, right? We cannot say that there was nothing, you know, no progression. At the same time, you know, we try to see, is this something that is by chance? So what we did, we evaluated 
the same scale by having a pool of independent movement disorder experts, 13 different doctors look at the video and they saw that there is still a separation, right? Actually, the results are pretty similar. This, the, the, on the right-hand side, central rating means independent evaluation of the video. And then we use a device, right? We developed that in previous studies. It's basically a combination of a watch and a, a phone, a smartphone, where people every morning need to wake up and do some exercise. These are basically hand turning, finger tapping, speech, etc. And this is the combination of the feature. The feature that were selected for this uh, model score were coming from PPMI because this is deployed also in the other study that I mentioned. It's, a, it's an observation study. And also there we found consistent separation, mostly coming from item linked to bradykinesia, it's lumens, right? Again, these are signals. We cannot talk about results because unfortunately the primary endpoint was not met and these are secondary endpoints. So once the primary is not met in a trial, the trial is failed. This is what we need to describe. I want to disclose that, otherwise it seems that you know, it's important, right? We cannot confirm that the drug is having an effect. So based on this, we decided to run another trial, right? What I want to show briefly today is the subgroup of patients that progress faster. We saw that in PPMI, that you can see that people that are diffuse malignant, or they were taking MAO-B, in this case I showed the diffuse malignant, they progress much more over two years than the other groups. So we ask ourselves, if they progress faster and the drug is stopping or slowing disease progression, maybe it's actually working more in this group. And this is what we actually found. If we first check and on placebo, you can see that the total population change approximately of six points, 5.6 points. The MAOB groups change about seven points, and then the fuse malignant change of 12.2 points. So about double of what they would change. This is on the placebo group, right? We're not taking any data. When you look at the actual treatment effect or potential treatment effect, we move from the 25% I showed you before to 40% and then 64%. So the diffuse malignant that are the one that progress much more actually are also the people that respond more eventually to the drug. If the, but the only, the only caveat I want to say is that these are uh, small groups, right? So you only have 59 patients there. I don't know, Ben, did you raise your hand? You want to comment? Yeah, again, I, I didn't say that. So basically, is that, that, that one? So basically, what is a diffuse malignant? There were many studies to define that. You could, you could have, you need to have 70, you need to be on the 75 percentile of the motor symptoms. So the combination of part two and part three. So your uh, stiffness, your slowness, your rigidity, your tremor are in the high end of the group. So you take all the people at, in the study, right? And then you say, who are the ones that are the worst? on the mother syndrome and baseline. And then they need to have also another syndrome among cognitive impairment, sleep problems, or autonomic dysfunction, right? So if you have these two, you probably are on a trajectory of progressing faster. And probably you are the one that could respond more. There are studies post-mortem showing that these people also have amyloid together with synuclein in the brain. So it's kind of a bit more aggressive disease, right? So, and this is important for us because before we throw the baby out with bad water saying this drug doesn't work, we need to make sure that it actually don't work, right? And this is what we are trying to learn. I don't know if I answer fully, Ben, I don't know. It's good. So and then we saw that basically on the part three, we also evaluated the digital endpoint. So this was actually time to worsening that I didn't show before. So there is another aspect that we need to consider, right? It's not just the, the number of points. So we said, how long it takes for people to progress five points? Five points is considered a significant difference, a meaningful difference from patients. There are many studies showing that. And we saw that there is a separation also there. It's, a, it's bigger into the diffuse malignant and the mal B. And then it is confirmed by the digital. Again, maybe this is by chance. We cannot say that because primary endpoint was not met. But our interpretation of this data is that motor progression is generally slow in Parkinson in one year. And then we need people that progress faster in our trials to make sure that we identify the, the drugs effect, the potential drug effect. So what we did based on this data, we designed another study that include this population to see if actually they respond. And we use as primary endpoint, the part three, the time to 
to a vent, right, that I show you, because if the drug is actually working, it should see an effect on this population that progress faster. And then we will run phase three, right, so that's on the line. So key go message my last slide. We should have the right target first, and we should probably invest in genomics biomarker to have the right target because it's difficult to find and maybe study find the patient better, identify the different Parkinson diseases, then go into the right population. That means on one end, the people that progress for a, this, this, this modifying drug, but also having biologically defined patients. I mean, I did not share because at the moment we don't have probably no a measure of synuclein that is reliable for Parkinson. And we include everyone, right? That's, a, that's the phenotype. But I'm sure that there are at least 10, 15% of the patients that don't have synuclein. So they could not have responded to this drug anyway. So once we have that biomarker, probably this will help. And then, of course, the right drug. This is also difficult. If you don't have that biomarker, you cannot confirm that the dose that we use was high enough or maybe was doing anything whatsoever on synuclein, right? Maybe it didn't. And then it's difficult, right? So we are working on that as well. And of course, Right endpoint, as I said, digital measure every day at home, and probably this could be used also in pivotal program later down the line. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for update on Alzheimer's disease, we have with us Dirk Pear, he's the CEO of AC Neuron. Thanks for coming. Uh, thank you, Hilal, and also thank you for the invitation to speak. So I give you a view from a drug developer perspective here on Alzheimer's, you know, what had been done in the past, and we still have to go quite a bit. Um, so before I start, because we talk a lot about symptomatic and these modifying drugs, I like to uh, align us on the concept. So under normal situation, you know, when there's no drug present or when the patient in the trial gets an inactive placebo, you have the decline of cognition Alzheimer's following the red arrow here. If you give a symptomatic drug, we have an immediate benefit in the cognition, but over time this will wear off and the trajectory will follow essentially the uh, gray arrow here. What we're really trying to achieve in the best case scenario is disease modification where we're just slowing the progression in an ideal case, we have it actually stopped completely so that the uh, green arrow follows the dotted line. So there's a complete hold. I think these concepts have a, quite a bit of impact on the drug development because you have this immediate cognitive benefit, for example, for symptomatic drugs. You can do a relatively short trial, three months, relatively few patients, 100, to get an idea, first idea whether your drug works, which is called proof of concept. It's not the final approval, but really get a feeling, okay, you're going in the right direction. With disease modification, you're looking at several hundreds of patients, you're looking at 18 to 24 months of trials, and that means that these are quite expensive to run, um, and that's a serious investment of any company to run these trials. I think what is not helping us as well in the field to some extent is that our preclinical model, so what we do in the lab, has sometimes a very poor translational value. Um, because we don't have Alzheimer's models, in, so to speak. We have models for some of the pathologies. And that explains some of the change of investment. When you think about oncology, I think the investment in oncology is, is probably 50 times or at least 10 to 50 times higher than what we see in Alzheimer's disease, for example. So how do we pick our approaches in, in, in research? So the first is we look at pathology. And I think this was the earliest was to look, okay, which neurons are actually affected in the brain by the disease? And there's some, they have a signal molecule called acetylcholine, and they seem to wear off very early in the process. That was discovered in the 70s. And as a logic um, continuation here, people de developed um, molecules or inhibit cholinesterase inhibitors that can actually boost neurotransmitter by preventing its degradation. Then we look at the pathology, which Alzheimer's described, which is shown at the top right, where you see extracellular lumps of protein uh, consisting of amyloid peptide called uh, amyloid plaques or senile plaques. And you have intracellular aggregation of another protein called tau protein, which also kills the neurons at the end of the day. So the plaques you can target with antibodies that mark them for degradation. Uh, when you go for tau, there are also antibodies, but um, as what we are doing, with small molecules looking in the cell and trying to block the aggregation within the cell. I think why amyloid was so um, favored is 
shown on the genetic side as well. You know, when you look on the bottom graph here, which I have on one of John Hardy's reviews, you see that the amyloid pathway, these are it's essentially the precursors from which the peptide is cut out, and the enzymes, the molecular scissors, which actually cut, they have mutations and they cause um, genetically inherited forms of Alzheimer's disease. They have 100% penetrance. So you can actually link genetics and pathology here very nicely. What people are now looking is going beyond this, which are mutations, for example, in modulators of neuroinflammation, like, like the strand 2 or CD33. We're also looking for other neurotransmitters. You know, memantin is one example where we're um, trying to block um, glutamate neurotoxicity. And I think the future to me is what I call systems biology, is where we look at the cellular level, what is really causing the death of the neurons and what is the sequence of events there. So this list um, doesn't compare to what we've seen on Parkinson's disease. So these are all Alzheimer's drugs which are approved. Um, when we start on the top, this aducadumab, I'm pretty sure many people have read about this. This is an A-beta plug clearing antibody. It was approved because based on a biomarker which was um, monitoring the prevention or the removal of plaques, um, but there was only one of the two trials showed a clear cognitive effect. And at the end of the day, the payers in the US uh, decided not to pay for the drug, only for patients in active trials. And as a result, the marketing was halted by Biogen. So that's an example, you know, where things can go wrong even at the very final stage. And the other drugs here are all symptomatics. Uh, when you remember the first slide, you know why they were quite fav famous or favorite, because they are relatively straightforward to develop. And they target different aspects. You know, there is, it's known that uh, there's insomnia and Alzheimer's disease, and the other ones are all uh, targeted at cognition, like the cholinesterase inhibitors. What you also see, if some drugs uh, work perfectly well, then there's a high incentive to develop uh, fast followers, you know, which have incremental improvement, as you can see in the cholinesterase inhibitor family here. I don't expect you now to, to read any of this. Um, this is just highlighting, uh, there's a guy called, a uh, gentleman called Jeff Cummings, who every year presents um, a paper showing the pipeline. And I like it because it shows you the number of approaches. It's huge, you know? And 70% of this is disease modification, 30% is uh, focused on, on a cognition on psychiatric syndrome symptoms. However, I have to say, you know, when you dig into detail, there is a lot of kind of uh, strange molecules in there. You know, there is grapeseed extract, there is essentially cannabis oil without the cannabis active ingredient and all these kinds of things. You know, it's, it's a huge bunch of, of many molecules. And I think when you go into phase three, then it really crystallizes which ones are the most important ones to watch out even in the next coming months here. And I think this has all to do, again, I mentioned aducardumab as an antibody that removes these A-beta plaques. Um, and as I said before, you know, these antibodies bind to the plaques and then the microglia, which is a cell, immune cell in the brain that starts essentially eating up them. And we will have readouts, uh, literally speaking, in the next couple of months. And there's gantanerumab from Roche. Uh, I think that will read out like October, November. There's lecanumab again from Biogen and ASI that will read out September, October time. And then we have another one from Eli Lilly reading out next year. I think these results will be super important because they will either tell us how to develop drug or how no, drugs or how not to develop drugs. So I'm personally quite optimistic because my view is that um, essentially the, 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 the drug from Biogen had some kind of efficacy. They were just very unlucky with the second trial. I think the other point here to make is that we have seen tremendous progress here with biomarkers. And what you see here on this cartoon I've lifted off um, the Alzheimer's Research UK website is that we have now imaging agents, so that's a rated chemicals, they bind to the pathology in living human brain in patients, and we can quantify. So we can quantify how much amyloid load there is and how much uh, is happening to tau neurofibrillary tangles. And there are others in development as well. And then we have biofluid markers that's essentially plasma where we draw blood or cerebral spinal fluid, which is the soup that essentially uh, is, is identical to what happens in the brain and the neurons, uh, outside the neurons in the interstitial space. And there we have a number of markers to help us already to really um, apply a, a, um, 
a precision medicine approach to really bring the right drugs at the right stage to the right patients. And I give you one example how we are looking at this because we have a tau drug and this is a PET scan on the left hand side and you just have to look how this color intensity changes from the left to right. That's the progression of Alzheimer's. That's the accumulation of tau protein. And when you want to intervene here, you need to find the population where you see the biggest changes in a short period of time, because that's the best population to test your drug that you get a readout in a reasonable time. I think just closing here with the outlook, I, I think the in immediately, um, upcoming readouts of a beta drug candidates will really pave the way for new drugs in two ways. Uh, we'll be looking either to develop more amyloid drugs, or we will be looking for combination therapy, or we will um, slightly go away to try uh, more and more of these new targets. And I think there we can see that tau is the next target. And there's still quite a bit of interest in symptomatic drugs. So there is sundowning, so excessive daytime sleepiness and agitation and Alzheimer's that's still undeserved, uh, under deserved, uh, deserved. And then the key challenges here still remain that we don't have the best preclinical models. Uh, we need really precision biomarker approaches. And I think something people have seen as well, you can remove the pathology, but it may take a certain time uh, until the benefit is actually seen. However, I would say the tremendous progress in the biomarkers will really catalyze these fields going forward. And I'm personally quite optimistic about this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dirk. And we'll close with an update from Huntington disease, Ignacio. Hello again. Um, this is the last talk of the day. I'm going to tell you a little bit about where we stand in the development of uh, therapies for Huntington's disease, but mostly with a focus on targeting the Huntington gene itself. Okay, um, just wanted to give an introduction. This is Huntington's disease. I think you've seen videos now. The difference between Huntington's and the other indications that we heard about today is that it's a monogenic disorder. Everybody has a polymorphic repeating exon 1, the beginning of the of the gene that encodes the Huntington uh, protein. And um, uh, normal individuals usually have anywhere between 17 and 22 repeats. When that repeat, which is unstable in the genome, expands, it leads to 100% um, uh, penetrant disease that normally manifests itself uh, during midlife, 30s or 40s. The majority of the majority of individuals have 42 repeats uh, with Huntington's disease, and there's, there's a juvenile or pediatric version after people, uh, if people inherit mutations that are uh, longer than 60. Um, it's interesting, again, the fact that the, there is an inverse relationship between the number of repeats in the Huntington gene and the age at onset. So you see people with 89 repeats usually develop symptoms in their teens. Um, and then people with 42 repeats have a a much broader range where they can begin to manifest the motor components of the disease. So some individuals, the green one here, uh, started developing symptoms pretty late in life with the same number of repeats as another individual who had really bad luck and started having symptoms at 30 years of age. But this is the normal distribution of the chromosomes between a normal, the normal population and the HD population. So based on this and some of the, the stories I told you before from Venezuela, it was obvious that there were other genetic factors that could explain uh, the remainder of the variants in terms of the age of motor onset. Okay, so based on this, there are three major approaches that the field has taken with um, few successes at the moment, but I think the field is well poised to, to make discoveries. We know what the mutation is in 100% of individuals. We know the clinical symptoms of the disease. And I think what we've been trying to do in the research component, and also as a way of driving therapeutics, is understand how the mutation at the level of DNA leads to the disease and vice versa. There are three approaches. The most obvious one in Huntington's, which is different from Huntington's or, I mean, Parkinson's or Alzheimer's is that in theory, if you can eliminate or decrease the product of the mutation itself, you should be able to effectively treat the disease in 100% of individuals. The question is how best to do that. 
then the identification of genes that modify the age of onset independently of the number of CAU repeats has been identified. And that's another area for therapeutic development, even though that's very early in uh, the, in fact, there are no clinical trials yet targeting these mechanisms. And then there are symptomatic therapies that include anything from stem cells to understanding the symptoms of Huntington's disease, for example, modulation of glutamate and dopamine transmission. Um, I've shown you this slide before. It's just important to keep in mind that there are a lot of different symptoms, some of which may arise outside of the brain and may arise outside of the areas of the brain where people typically associate the motor component, which is the basal ganglia, which is the region here that progressively degenerates beginning about 20, 25 years prior to uh, manifestation in the clinic. Another thing that's important in the context of Huntington's disease, which is different from Parkinson's in many respects, is the fact that it's really a multiple system disorder. So typically the cotypetamine, the striatum, the basal ganglia heavily degenerates, but that is also true in, in different cortical regions, in, in, other, in other brain uh, subcircuits that explain the symptomatology of the disease and that are highly variable. With this, what I wanted to say is that the majority of the uh, approaches that are being tested clinically at the moment are limited in distribution and therefore they're unlikely, even if they work in one symptom, to address all of the aspects of the disease. Okay, so this is just summarizes how the field has been dealt with this. And part of it is driven by a lack of understanding of the disease. Part of it is limited by the technologies that enable, um, for example, gene therapy agents. Um, or, or large molecules like antisense oligonucleotides. So in the context of gene therapy, there is an AMT-130 gene, um, gene therapy trial with a microRNA that leads to the degradation of both the normal version of Huntington and the mutated version of Huntington. And there are also siRNAs in development. These are injected directly into the brain in a neurosurgical procedure. Uh, there are a few oral drugs, Branaplan and PPC518, which affect splicing of the Huntington gene. And again, these are also not allele selective, but they go everywhere in the body. And then there are um, uh, drugs that are administered via lumbar puncture um, every four or eight weeks or 16 weeks. And there are two programs, the Roche Dominersen ASO and the WAVE ASO that is allele selective. Okay, so when you're trying to interpret clinical trial data to inform you what you should do next to optimize these drugs, there are some complications with this figure. First one is three different uh, drug types, three different routes of administration, very different tissue uh, distribution and cellular distribution. Some are targeting only neurons, some distribute everywhere. The molecular mechanisms by how they work is very different. And uh, there are specific safety issues, as, as, as I'll tell you in a second. Some of these drugs have been stopped in development due to the toxicity issues that they observe, and for which we don't really understand the sources of that toxicity. So like Dirk mentioned, the Huntington's field is probably a decade behind the Alzheimer's field in this, in this respect. And if you care to listen to me again, you can come to my talk on Friday about this, but basically each one of these modalities given the different distribution needs a specific biomarker strategy, both for efficacy and safety. And that's been a, a real problem in the field. Okay, so this is a table that I've compiled and not published on, on the different trials. This was as it started in 2020. And you can see here that there are the modalities with antisense oligonucleotide. Uh, the Roche study went all the way to phase three, the WAVE study, phase one and two. Um, the uh, gene therapies, there were three programs, AB5, microRNA, MT30, is currently in phase one, two study, both in the US and in Western Europe. There are siRNA, sorry, siRNA drugs by Alnylam and Atalanta Biogen, but again, both of these are even administered differently and there are non-allele selective. And finally, that the splicing modulators, there's three companies, two of which Novartis and PTC are in phase two at the moment. Okay, let me tell you the situation here. The only one that has been allele selective is that only targets the mutation is the WAVE program, but that only serves to treat about 30% of all the HD individuals. 
because only those have a polymorphism that enables an ASO to recognize it. AMT130 is not allele selective, but it's effective to exon one protein. And that's important because there is reason to believe that that is the pathogenic species. And finally, the Takeda Sangamo program, which is still in preclinical development, is the one that meets all of the criteria, but this program is currently halted. Okay, so the, I'll just tell you how this changed in about a period of two years. The ROSE trial was stopped due to adverse events. The WAVE programs one and two were stopped due to a lack of pharmacological effect in the brain. They are continuing with another ASO. This stopped development due to adverse events or for unknown reason. So what looked like a great uh, scenario for the HU community two years ago is now quite, quite worrisome and for different reasons. And I think the challenges right now is really to learn uh, from the, the current status and try to optimize how we do the clinical trial. So three things that all drug discovery people know very well, but don't respect all the time is you need to show that your drug engages the target, that at least it's a biological response, and hopefully if it is affecting a clinically relevant measure. This should follow a temporal trajectory and people shouldn't take shortcuts, meaning a drug should demonstrate this and this before you can interpret what happens in a phase three study. And typically the reasons for failure are that many of these steps are not followed for a variety of reasons. Also, I wanted to say that, um, and I have a wonderful chemistry colleague here, most of the problem, uh, the problem is resides with biology. I think the medicinal chemistry, toxicology people have learned how to optimize drugs and minimize their side effects. It's usually the biology that either we don't understand how to predict a safety signal in terms of a biological mechanism that then we can improve upon, or uh, that we don't fully uh, understand the disease mechanistically well enough that the biology we're pursuing or how we're targeting the biology, for example, extracellular amyloid versus some other APP dependent process may not be the right way to do it. Okay, so in the case of the potential reason for failures, the dose wasn't good enough and therefore you need to have measures that the drug is targeting, in this case, Huntington, is lowering Huntington um, sufficiently enough and in the right part of the brain that we think drives the pathology uh, based on the symptomatology. Okay, second reason for potential failures is that the target may be engaged but in the disease state of response is blunted. So it's not enough to say I've lowered Huntington, which was shown in the Roche phase two trial, but that Huntington is coming from what part of the brain and do you have a, a functional response biomarker that tells you that lowering Huntington, say 50%, has a functional benefit. That was never measured, that was never incorporated into those studies, therefore we can interpret that data. So we really need measurements that reflect the action of a drug, whether it's a small molecule, in the part of the brain where you think you're having the intended effect. In addition, you need to identify functional biomarkers. Um, Derek was talking about neurofilament, for example, for axonal degeneration, white matter damage. In the case of Huntington, encephalin is a protein or a peptide that's secreted from a medium spiny neurons that degenerate and is accumulated in CSF. And that's another one that may speak to a functional response biomarker in the striatum. Uh, finally, the marker may not inform of brain circuitry changes. For example, neurofilament may be coming from the cortical uh, parts of the brain. And if you're trying to target the basal ganglia, neurofilament may not respond to the drug. And therefore, you may have a biological effect. You just can measure it with this biomarker. And finally, for all of us that are doing preclinical research, we know that the animal models model some aspects of the disease, but not others. And none of the animal models of Huntington's disease have a critical component of the disease, which is degeneration of cells in the basal ganglia. That just doesn't happen until they late in disease. And therefore, we really have to call into question some of the hypotheses that we derived uh, for preclinical testing. Okay, so from, cell to, from, from cells to circuits, we know we can suppress mutant Huntington via different mechanisms that should trigger a cell effect, a circuit effect, and hopefully a functional domain improvement. And our goal over the last few years, I would say a decade or more, has been to develop assays that we can use in phase two, uh, phase one and phase two studies that tells us that we can measure Huntington suppression and that has a cell and a circuit effect in different biomarkers that will be the subject of my seminar on Friday, so I won't speak anymore about this. Um, 
And finally, there are other reasons which have to do with clinical trial design and patient selection. And it is true um, in the recent cases of uh, spinal muscular atrophy or ALS in the SOD1 trials that uh, there's several things that are happening. The primary endpoint may not be adequate. Everybody wants to see a change in motor score as measured by Korea in Huntington's. That may not be the best one or the most sensitive one to a specific therapy. And that's, it's very hard to actually define that a priori based on the preclinical models. The patient selection could be suboptimal. Therefore, the study was underpowered. And that's same as in Alzheimer's, the slow versus fast progressors. That's clearly the case in the SOD ALS trials that the fast progressors seemed to be responding, but there were very few of those, and therefore the trial did not pick up a significant effect. The length of the study may not be sufficient. Again, this is the same issue in the context of ALS, was a six month phase three trial, because people die normally within 18 months of the trial, they thought that was long enough, and that clearly is not. When they stopped the trial, people started improving at about 12 months. So the design of the study limited the ability to pick up a significant effect. And finally, the target may be wrong. And apologies to Dirk and other amyloid aficionados, but maybe extracellular amyloid is actually relevant to the disease. So you can eliminate it with the antibodies and may do very little for you clinically. That will be demonstrated or not, hopefully in the next few years. Okay. Finally, the, the, the timing of intervention is critical in all of these indications. And we've done a lot of work uh, just to show that in humans, we know that the prodromal or pre-clinically manifest phase of the disease starts about 20, 25 years prior to onset. That means that a person in their 20s with Huntington's disease, with typical Huntington's disease, will not have any clinical symptoms, but they will have ongoing degeneration and functional changes in the brain, but it will take 20 years for them to go to a neurologist and get diagnosed. So this means that we have a lot of time to intervene and hopefully slow the disease. But that also means that the, by the time we do a clinical trial, which is usually manifest individuals, um, it may be very late to reverse some of those symptoms. So that is, a, that is a real challenge in terms of trial design. Okay, so some parting thoughts, evaluate agent distribution and PDFX in the circuits you think you wanna treat. And if you're gonna go into gene therapy or you end up working in gene therapy, invest in delivery because that's a serious issue. Uh, you need to have a functional biomarker. I don't think it's enough to say we decrease amyloid if it doesn't have any effect on a functional readout of the circuit, for example, uh, functional connectivity uh, or, or some other task that may be very sensitive to the integrity of the circuits. The timing length of a study and progression landmarks is very important, particularly if we're gonna go into a pre-symptomatic population, which is the case in all of the neurodegenerative indications. And you can't do a trial for 10 years. Nobody's gonna be able to spend several hundred billion dollars for a Huntington's trial. So I think that's a real problem for us. And finally, I would say it's very important that we include post-mortem collections of those individuals who die uh, during the study, particularly after the study in gene therapy, to really understand the distribution of the drug, which may be very different in humans as it was modeled in animals. So with that, I would say thank you. And I don't know if there are questions or not, but thanks, Hilal, again. Thank you, Ignacio. I think because of the time we're, we're limited for the Q&A, I will only leave the opportunity, maybe if there are any of the patients that have any questions for any of the scientists, uh, including uh, Simon, who's still online. So Ben, you had a question? Yeah, this is uh, this is would require a long discussion. I just briefly said in PPMI this observation study we deployed the digital biomarker right. So we use that data to think which score we would use, which uh, which uh, test and feature we'll be using in the, the, the score. So, but it would, you know, we can discuss maybe offline because it's complicated, but I'm happy to talk with you after, okay? Okay. If there are no other questions and a couple logistical issues, just remember that for the scientific program, which starts tomorrow, 
this, uh, the lecture will be held in, the, in another building, not here. So don't come here in the morning. And now for the speakers, panelists, sponsors, for the dinner, please just wait outside this door. It's not very far, but we have a bus that will take us all there. It's about a five minutes drive. So this way we can go there faster. Okay, thank you very much for all for coming and look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thank you, Simon.